Good morning. So welcome back, everyone. I am hoping everyone had a wonderful night last night, enjoyed the city of Tampa, dinner, wonderful conversations. And we're going to try to outdo yesterday, which will be very difficult to do, but I think you'll be very pleasantly surprised for what we have for you. So welcome to the second day of our GNSI Global and National Security Institute Tampa Summit, featuring the eighth great power competition, the future and ethics of uncrewed and autonomous warfare. And yesterday's speakers included Dr. Eric Eisenberg, who announced a recent award of our Human Dynamics Project, General McKinsey, the former CENTCOM commander and the current executive director of the USF Global and National Security Institute, who enlightened us with the experiences that he had and also discussed all the wonderful things that GNSI is doing. And you can read all about that in our current and future events. And we're just getting started at GNSI. We're just getting started. This has just been, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So each time we'll have more activities, more announcements, both in terms of academia, scholarship, and how do we bridge the gap between policy and technology and bring the platform of the military and scholarship together to do that. We also had, we heard from Lieutenant General Gregory Guillaume, who basically outlined how CENTCOM looks at in the activities of the uncrewed and autonomous within the CENTCOM AOR, and also Major General Dunlap, who talked about the ethics of the autonomous systems. Our panelists examined the foreign defense partnerships, a global competitive market, and what a wonderful panelist they were, and Paul Lushenko did a wonderful job, and David DeRoche to do that. For today's event, we got some wonderful speakers as well. So we'll begin the opening remarks with Dr. Roger Kangas, who's the academic dean and professor of Central Asian um, and, and Central Asian studies at NISA, and followed by a, um, our keynote speaker, Dr. Stephanie Tompkins, who's a director of Defense Advanced Research Project uh, Agency, uh, to do that. And following our morning panel, we'll break for lunch and return promptly at 1.30 to hear from this afternoon's esteemed keynote speaker, Lieutenant General Grinkovich, who is the head of AFSENT and Combined Air Force Component Commander of the United States Central Command to do that. And after our keynote address, we'll begin our four concurrent breakout sessions, which will enable even more insight and audience participation, and start thinking about which one of these panels you would like to attend, and all promise uh, to be amazing to do that. So the breakout session one will examine artificial intelligence, ethics, and lethal autonomy. Breakout session two looks at the future of uncrewed systems. Breakout session three will address industry use advancement of UAVs, and breakout session four will explore the security of autonomous systems. And then we'll take a short break and we'll return. Uh, we, uh, the moderators from each breakout session will spend a few minutes summarizing their individual sessions for the rest of the audience uh, to do that. So that's our schedule for today. So let's get started with a conference now with opening remarks from Dr. Roger Kangas, academic, uh, academic dean of NISA, for this morning's opening remarks. Dr. Kangas serves also as a professor of Central Asian Studies at NISA. He previously served as a professor of Central Asian Studies uh, at the George C. Marshall Center at the European Security in Germany. Dr. Kangas also served as a deputy director of the Central Asian Institute at Paul Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University and research analyst on central affairs 
for the Open Media Research Institute in Prague. And I just want to take this opportunity to personally thank Roger from his continued support from day one. And then Director Wolf of NISA had a special vision for our platform today. And the vision, I think, is coming into a reality after some time. Uh, we use the term, sometimes it was pushing snowball up the hill in Tampa in August, but we have done it. And here we are. And also, Roger, I would like to give a special thanks for your team that we have worked to do this, uh, Cindy Pritchard, and also soon retiring Dr. Richard Russell, that we work continuously in almost every uh, uh, conference that we have had. NISA had a tremendous participation to do that. So Roger, thank you very much for that. And please give me a round of applause for Roger. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Thank you, Adib, for those kind words. Um, and I know that uh, we do have a busy day ahead of us. Uh, yesterday, I thought, was uh, you know, quite a tour of the topic of uncrewed and autonomous weapons, uh, systems, and other facets. And in conversations with our speakers and with other individuals throughout the day, um, you know, quite frankly, I felt that I was learning a lot. This is a topic that is intriguing for me. In no way would I consider myself an expert, but I do want to be a good student of this and because it's that important. So, you know, Adib, thank you so much for putting this together, for really guiding this here on the USF campus. I also want to thank uh, GNSI for, one, its presence and now its desire to really take these sorts of opportunities to engage um, in the academic space, in the policy space, um, you know, to, to, to put a practical spin on what are often intense and difficult theoretically framed questions. That's a challenge that should be recognized in terms of its difficulty, but one I think that needs to be acknowledged for its importance. You know, I also want to thank our colleagues from CENTCOM and SOCOM. Uh, who have attended and participated events over the years and who are here uh, today and who were here yesterday. Um, you know, this is for you. Uh, it scratches, if you will, that itch that is important in our commands, but also your participation allows us a chance to give a reality check to the themes and topics of discussion. So, again, for all involved, you know, it's a, it's a whole group of people that come together uh, and quite frankly, I think have done this quite well. This is our eighth iteration. I look forward, inshallah, to many more. Uh, it's an opportunity for us in Washington also to get a reality check of what life is like outside the Beltway. And trust me, that is important. Um, now, in, in terms of the NISA Center, because you do hear it sort of mentioned and referred to, and, and we are sort of a, uh, what I would say, an interesting creature within the Defense Department. We are government employees, but we work in an academic environment. Um, and our mission really is to engage with partners and colleagues, with professionals from our region. You know, it's primarily the central region, you know, the, the Levant, the Gulf, Central Asia, but it also includes South Asia. It also includes North Africa. We work in you know, Arabic and Russian and French and you know, other languages as necessary. We've conducted programs in Hebrew and Turkmen, you name it. Uh, whether it's a program here in the US, in Washington or another location, uh, we run several down here in Tampa, uh, or it's abroad, uh, conducting programs you know, in uh, Oman, in Kazakhstan, in Nepal, uh, in Morocco. And in all of these, the goal of our organization is to express and explain U.S. policy. That's part of it, to debate U.S. policy and the U.S. presence and U.S. position. But it's also to hear the perspectives from the region. How does this resonate in North Africa? How does the discussion of, of our topics at hand, how does this resonate in the Gulf? How does this resonate in South Asia? What are things that we do um, you know, received, uh, the second and third order effects that were discussed yesterday? 
Um, these are absolute wild cards, and, and I agree with the, the, the comments that, you know, we can't sit and, and almost refrain from doing anything out of fear of second and third order effects. Uh, uh, you know, Professor Dunlop's uh, uh, commentary, I thought, was, was outstanding on this uh, yesterday. But we do have to be mindful of it, and we do have to monitor it. And, and I think this is something that our center, you know, we try to work on, because as the U.S. engages in the region, we can't just assume that we're America, you're going to work with us. There is a competition. There is a global competition underway, the theme of this series of programs. And we need to be an active part in this, and we need to explain ourselves fully. So we will do that as the day goes on. I'll close my remarks with two very quick comments. Uh, first is I am looking forward to the discussions today when we look at you know, the various, not just the technologies and methods that are part of uncrewed and autonomous warfare, but also the capabilities. We've looked at the ethical and legal issues, but let's also look at the issue of trust, and this is going to be brought up today, and I think quite well, of how do we rely on these as an integrated system with humans, with us? Um, these are going to be some challenging questions. Um, and so our speakers, the panels, the discussions, you all, the questions, um, let's have a wonderful second day of this event. I should also add as a second comment, and this is particularly geared to the students in the room and the students who may be coming later today, um, this is a great opportunity. You're at a wonderful university. I've enjoyed getting to know a bit more of the University of South Florida. Um, you have great faculty uh, and resources here. Take advantage of those as much as you want to enjoy life on campus, also enjoy the academic life on campus and ask the hard questions. Get up and speak with the speakers when they're done. Don't be shy, introduce yourself. You may find that somebody is addressing an issue that you find of interest. That's critical. And I should add on a final note, I do know that USF is playing Navy this weekend. My colleague, Dave DeRoche, who's a West Point grad, will be cheering USF all day on Saturday. So good, good luck with the game. <laughs> anyway, I look forward to the rest of the day. Adib, I'll turn the microphone back to you. Thank you so much, Dean Kangas, and wonderful advice for our students, and go USF to do that. Now it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome our keynote speaker for this morning, Dr. Stephanie Tompkins. Doc, Dr. Tompkins is the director of the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA. She began her career as a U.S. Army intelligence officer, but has since spent most of her time since then leading scientists and engineers in interdisciplinary programs. This includes three years as vice president for research at the Colorado School of Mines, over 10 years in the industry conducting research projects in planetary geology, imaging, and managing diverse portfolios that span the range of sensing and analysis technologies, and over 20 years total at DARPA, including prior services as a program manager in multiple leadership roles. As a director, she has championed the expansion of the agency's innovation ecosystem that DARPA delivers on its mission of creating breakthrough technologies for national security. I'm also pleased to announce that she will be having a special event, as I announced a few times yesterday, at the Marshall Center tomorrow at 9 a.m. in room 3707. This presentation will provide excellent insight into what DARPA does and ways to work with the nation's premier organization creating breakthrough technologies and capabilities for national security. I highly recommend that you attend Dr. Tompkins' presentation, either in person or virtually. You can find more information in your program guide. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Tompkins, Stephanie Tompkins. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for your interest in this topic writ large. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk um, 
maybe one step backwards, even a little bit more broadly, focusing on the subject of ethical, but also um, societal and legal um, implications for emerging technologies in general. Um, in order to do that, I've sort of got three things I want to um, accomplish today. I'm going to start off by giving you a little bit of a sense of, of DARPA and how we work and who we are um, and why we should be caring so much about the topic. Um, and then I'll give you a better understanding of how we manage ethical, legal, and societal, so ELSI um, implications, um, shorthand LC, uh, for our various programs. And then I'll dive into a couple of very specific ex um, examples focused on autonomy. So if you see the timeline behind me, um, these are what we think of as a few of our very greatest hits. Um, DARPA has actually been around for 65 years and has been investing ever since its uh, very start um, in breakthrough technologies for national security. We were actually founded in response to a significant, um, at the time, probably one of the biggest uh, technological surprises our nation had ever faced, and that was the launch of the Sputnik satellite. And when DARPA was started, it was with this very simple charter, which is to ensure that the nation is not surprised like that again. Um, it's really hard to, to uh, prevent surprise in the sense that we don't have crystal balls that can predict the future. So the DARPA approach to that mission has been to always be at the bleeding edge and maybe beyond that bleeding edge so that if we are in fact making those technological investments into surprise ourselves, it makes it much more likely that we are not the victims um, of that type of surprise from others. And what you see on the timeline are examples of some of those major investments. So on the top half, um, particularly for our, our military uh, stakeholders, you'll see the kinds of things that we are best known for in terms of military systems. And that includes seminal investments in communications and networking technology, um, first stealth aircraft, um, uncooled infrared night vision, miniaturized uh, GPS receivers, unmanned aerial vehicles, um, many, many more, but those are the ones that I think are, are most easily talked about in a broad audience. Down on the bottom half, for our university audience, um, this is really the enabling technologies that DARPA is most famous for. So this would include um, actually the creation um, of material science as a discipline. Before that, it was much more stovepiped into, into different, uh, like chemistry and metallurgy and mining engineering and, and things like that. And um, for those of you that might happen to work in material science, the interdisciplinary centers we created back in the early 60s still exist today as National Science Foundation MERSEX. So that, that heritage um, and push into the scientific community is actually something that we have done multiple times in history and are very proud of. Um, also on the bottom, you see this little experiment we did uh, called the ARPANET, which you may knew, know, then uh, grew up, graduated to become the internet. Um, that also had an intermediate step, I should point out, where the National Science Foundation took the ARPANET, turned it into NSFNET, and grew it with, by adding more and more university research centers um, and turned it into a very extensive and very useful government research network. And then it was actually policymakers like Al Gore um, who put into place the laws that transformed it into the internet um, that we have today. A lot of seminal work, obviously, in microelectronics micro and artificial intelligence. Um, and then I think the one that uh, might surprise people, and it's worth telling a little story about, is um, what you see there where it says nucleic acid-based vaccines. And I'm going to tell the story because it, it will help illustrate a little bit how DARPA works. So, we only have, we're only about 220 government employees. Half are technical, half are support staff that do contracting and security and human resources, you know, um, information technology, things like that. The program managers, the technical staff, are all on a limited term. So we all have expiration dates on our badges and the, and the basic premise is that DARPA is a place where we are focusing on making big bets, looking far out into the future and taking risk. And one of the most dangerous things um, that sort of prevents people from being risk tolerant is staying in one place too long because you either get too gun shy because you had failure or you get too comfortable because you've had success. And either way, somewhere around the fourth or fifth year is when we, we typically push for rotation. So every single one of our technical people um, rotates. And the other advantage of that is that we are constantly making space for new ideas and people who have been out in the world um, not necessarily, you know, tightly embedded, um, only enclosed government circles. So they are constantly making us aware of what the opportunity space is. All right, so we had a program um, that had failed. 
It was a program to focus on making artificial blood for the battlefield, which I think you could imagine why that would be really important. Technically, it succeeded in the sense that artificial blood was made. Um, practically, it failed because the artificial blood was so expensive that it just could not be made um, useful. In the course of rotation, we had a new program manager come in. He was actually an Air Force medical doctor, uh, which is just not necessarily important to the story except to show you sort of the diversity of the kinds of program managers we get. We have faculty members from universities come on leave of absence. We have people from industry. We have people from government labs. And, and that most specifically does include um, uniform um, scientists and engineers as well. Anyway, this, this doctor said, as like, he was closing down the program, he said, I want to ask a slightly different question. If the blood is too expensive for battlefield use, what would make expensive blood worth the price? And that led to a really interesting series of questions. You know, could the blood be used to heal people? Could it be used as a cure? Could it be used as a vaccine? And he hosted a series of workshops um, pulling people in from across the country. And one of the um, companies that showed up was a little 12-person company that you might have heard of. Uh, it's called Moderna. Um, it led to a series of investments in mRNA vaccines and a completely and fundamentally different way of vaccinating people. So we got off the question of how quickly you can make chickens lay eggs and inject vaccines in them and got into a fundamentally different way of thinking about it. It was a military question that he posed, right? He was actually, he said, our service members are going all around the world and our vaccine system does not work uh, to protect them against the variety of diseases that they have to face. So we need something completely different. And oh, by the way, I was actually there about 11 years ago when he said this, if we ever should have a pandemic, this could come in handy. So I think it's a really good example of how DARPA works. Um, I should point out also the National Institutes of Health had been investing in that kind of technology. The baseline was there. It's DARPA's job to accelerate and push it with a high risk, high payoff mindset, much, much beyond what the normal science and technology ecosystem would do. So we, we swoop in, we make a big bet, we push as fast as we can. If we fail, we get out as fast as we can, and we continue to make more bets with the idea that when we succeed, we tend to make major societal changes. So just to summarize that, our role in the science and technology ecosystem is to focus on those breakthrough paradigm shifting um, kinds of solutions. We are very comfortable with risk. We embrace and actually celebrate it. We don't like to be on roadmaps. If we're anywhere on a roadmap, we're looking at how we can take something that might be a 20-year-out goal and bringing it in you know, by, by twice or three times faster. Um, and if possible, we'd like to do something that would cause you to rip up the roadmap and have a completely fresh um, look at what's possible. All right, so in that world, the question of ethical implications, and we think broadly ethical, legal, and societal implications, they tend to all feed into each other of these emerging technologies becomes really important. DARPA actually has a model that is focused entirely on speed. We bring people in, and since they're only at DARPA for about four years, we need to make sure they are not wasting their time. So we, we limit bureaucracy and we get them so that they can start new programs that they think that will change the world and they can execute on those programs as quickly as possible. That means we need to have a way to also think about the ethical, legal, and societal implications of those technologies they are creating that can ma match to that speed. So what we have done, um, I'm gonna start with, you know, it was very, very ad hoc until about a dozen years ago. And at that point, we actually asked the National Science Foundation, um, I'm sorry, the National Academy of Sciences to do a study and help us sort of frame the problem a little bit better. Now, I should point out, DARPA actually starts about 50 new programs a year, just to give you a sense of the pace and the volume that we have to be thinking about. So um, they did this study, and they came back with a number of um, recommendations. And, you know, it talked about what some of the foundational technologies we should be really concentrating on. Um, information technology, particularly because of the privacy implications, you sort of look in that top box. Um, synthetic biology and neuroscience were three areas that were, were sort of huge and ripe for really starting to create a more formal and structured LC process. Um, lots of application domains, um, which will look very familiar. These were just sort of highlights of them, everything from cyber weapons to um, obviously robotics and autonomous systems. And then a whole series of best practices, including um, engaging LC throughout our program lifecycle from before you create the program 
you know, while you're still thinking about it to actually executing the program and then what kinds of recommendations would come out of it. Um, lots of regular review, lots of engagement with stakeholders. Um, what that then led to um, is DARPA essentially setting up a series of processes, very, very strong in our information technology and biology focused offices um, to really bring in a collection of ethicists and scientists and legal experts who could bring subject matter expertise um, to bear on our different programs in the, force, in the form of advice and insight and constant uh, touch points to help us understand what the consequences of success might be. So if it turns out that in our wildest dreams, the thing that the big risk we're taking is gonna pay off, we wanna make sure that we are gathering the data and doing the research to help inform policymakers who then have to make laws and regulations around these technologies with the best information they possibly can have, right? So um, this is something that it focuses on what is the character of the technology, um, really focusing on some of the fundamental ethics questions that come up in research all the time regarding um, you know, consent. And, but really, um, and I think most important today, is thinking about the, um, the consequences. And so, as I said, we kind of drove that heavily into those three original domains, um, uh, you know, kind of the biological, the neuroscience, um, and the information technology space. And one of the things we are on the cusp of doing today is finding a way to scale that to cross the entire agency. You know, and, and you know, really you need to think about it from that, the perspective that many things that seem harmless could have profound consequences. And most of us as technologists don't think about and, and imagine what some of those scenarios can be. Now, sometimes we need access to science fiction writers. We need access to people who really do make a living thinking about consequences. So while I have a lot of folks in what we call our micro um, systems, my, micro systems technology office, their job is to make better, faster chips. Um, I'm pretty sure all of them would say, yeah, not me, don't worry about LC, I'm just making smaller chips, right? Um, but it probably doesn't take more than five to 10 minutes of, of thinking to realize how those things could potentially run wild, um, let loose in society unconstrained. So you just have to, you have to give yourself a chance to think. And as we do a lot with um, human subjects research and animal research, we can think about low risk, medium risk, and high risk, and then we can design our LC approach to each program to conform to those risk levels and to provide support throughout its life cycle. So when we ask, when we talk to our program managers, you know, the um, opportunities for LC um, examination engagement are constant, many, um, and really throughout the program life cycle. So we tell them that, the, you know, the right time for LC engagement is, is any time and always. So that means when the program manager is dreaming up the program, they should be engaging with LC experts to figure out whether or not um, they need a stronger and more supportive structure in the program itself. Um, if the answer is yes, then they need help throughout the program, and they need regular feedback and touch points as new surprises and discoveries are made um, throughout the life cycle um, of the program, and as we are making recommendations, again, to the policymakers in the Department of Defense, in Congress, and elsewhere as to what are the implications um, of this technology when it runs loose. All right, so I want to give you a couple of very uh, uh, con uh, specific examples, so I'm gonna start off with a program called Urban Reconnaissance Through Supervised Autonomy, or URSA. Um, and, and URSA was really about distinguishing friend from foe in crowded urban scenarios. Um, and a lot of the traditional methods tend to lean towards, you know, just looking for threats. And it really does tend to push people towards an unconscious bias, towards, towards everything looking like a threat. And part of the ERSA goal was to say, we need to start understanding innocent behaviors and how do you discriminate between things that are a little bit blurry, especially when people are under a lot of tension. And the view of the technical vision of the program was to have autonomous systems working in concert with humans to sort of probe and push at crowds to, to help segregate behaviors one way or another. So like a real simple one would be at my building um, back at DARPA in, in Northern Virginia, it's an ordinary looking office building and there are lots of people who are wandering around outside the building. And sometimes people take photographs of it. Um, sometimes people will sit at the bus stop across the street for an extraordinarily long time. Um, should you worry? 
There are plenty of reasons, innocent reasons, why they might be doing those things, and there are potentially nefarious reasons why they might be doing those things. Are there things you could do that would elicit behavior, such as pulling a vehicle up in front of them and blocking their view, to see how they respond? Do they go around? Do, do they move to a better vantage point, right? And so these are things where um, having lots and lots of humans engaged can be a little bit overwhelming and impractical. Can you use autonomous systems to help you? The hypothesis was yes. On the other hand, as you can imagine, this is fraught with ethical questions, legal implications. And so um, this program was designed with what we think of as sort of heavy touch ELSI. It's like, so moderate touch ELSI would be we have a panel of experts and they engage two to three times a year with the program teams. They hear the results of what's happening, they provide feedback, and they go home. With URSA, we went in with a much more um, intense situation. We have a working group of about 20 people who are embedded in the teams all of the time, right? So they are taking from the program, the scenarios, the technical goals, the various vignettes that we're working towards, and you can see the categories of experts that we have that would include military folks, technologists, obviously ethicists and legal experts, and potentially um, behavioral scientists, all of them working together and embedded on the different um, uh, performer teams. So these are the people who are actually doing the work, the companies and universities that we had funded. Um, and then they helped by really focusing on things that might seem trivial, can be really profound, like having um, standardized terminology where everyone is actually talking about the same thing at the same time. Um, a framework for being able to apply LC in a practical space. Um, technical requirements and various levels of human machine control, so human supervisory control over machines um, throughout the ultimate goal, you know, to, in order to meet the technical goals of the program. And then this is fed in constant loops to those performer teams so that they are, they are updating and adapting as they go. Um, we like to say, you know, the very, very simplistic analogy is that you can build a car and you can try to bolt some brakes on afterwards, um, or you can build the brakes in. And if you really think about this, and I think a lot of you, if there's folks in the audience who are ethicists, you already know this, putting brakes in actually lets you go faster, not slower. And so we want to build those brakes in intelligent ways so that we can actually drive the technology much more quickly rather than in ways where we are creeping along because we don't understand what the landscape are, is or where we race forward and smash into something and come to a, uh, um, a screeching halt. So one of the things that was, was observed out of this was, you know, among our teams, some of them fully embraced and completely tightly coupled with their LC support folks. Um, and others, it was a more, maybe a loose coupling. And one of the really interesting and fascinating things that came out of this, at least in this, this uh, you know, one program that we were looking at, is the more tightly coupled, actually, the better and more quickly the teams actually did advance. Um, and they were able to align with commander's intent, not just with a bunch of technologies that then had to be mapped back um, to what the users wanted to do. So with that example, I'll show you another um, autonomy and AI focused program, um, which is adopted similarly. It's gonna, it basically, I'm not gonna go through the details of the structure. It's adopted a similar pro, um, approach in terms of LC sort of intimacy in the program structure. But I wanted to talk a little bit about what the program is meant to do because it starts us to move us towards the kinds of questions you have to think of when you're talking about lethal um, autonomy and, and, and autonomous weapon systems. And that is a program called In the Moment. Um, in the Moment, it, it, in some ways it's, it might be easier to understand if I tell you what the program manager originally was gonna call it. He was gonna call it the least worst decision. And he was thinking about all of those times when you are facing a decision where there actually is no clear, good answer. And yet, you have to make a decision and you have to move on. And in these worlds of, I think, what these conversations have already been going on and will continue to have of lethal autonomy, that you are right there in the sweet spot. But if you think about it, there are many, many different kinds of situations that put you under similar pressure and under similar competition of laws and ethics and immediacy and urgency and saving certain lives over potentially not saving other lives, the horrible decisions none of us ever wanna have to be in, but in the military you often are faced with, um, unfortunately, and we're having no choice to deal with. Um, so 
where can autonomy help? Right? What is the extent to which you would want to be able to turn um, control over to an autonomous system, and how much control would you ever actually relinquish? This was actually born out of, um, so, so we actually thought about a lot of different programs and one, problems, and one of the ones we wanted to settle on, because it allows for a very open conversation with all of society, um, is the question of triage. Mass casualty triage in particular, and this was born out of conversations with some of the emergency room personnel in Las Vegas after the mass shooting there, where they were overwhelmed, and doctors were just completely buried under having to make life and death decisions without a lot of context and a lot of support, trying to figure out if they could delegate those decisions to other people, not even knowing if that in itself was ethical or legal, and just the, the context of that, and then you throw that similar situation to the military where you will now add the fact that you were probably being shot at while you're making those decisions, um, completely changes the, the context of what people may have to be dealing with, led for a very, very interesting problem for this in the moment kind of question. So, so in the moment is really about decision making and decision support under very extreme um, and complex and often unfortunate situations. So happy to answer questions about the program itself if, um, later if you're interested, but that is really what it is, it's about. So it's a, autonomous decision support leading on a spectrum to autonomous decision making, an understanding where and how much you can encode human values and then how much you can fundamentally trust and agree with the decisions that are made under those really extraordinary difficult situations. And I think any of you who worked in this space know that even when you have a group of humans doing it, there will not be extreme consensus on what was right and what was wrong, so you can see why this is such a fraught topic. But it's a topic we felt we had to um, tackle head on, and so we're tackling it head on with that same LC structure that I showed you for URSA with experts embedded in the teams working full time so that we can move forward and then again help inform policymakers of what they need to know to put into place the rules that ultimately the rest of us will have to follow. Okay, so I'm gonna stop with the examples and I'm just gonna close by telling you a little bit more about what's coming next. Um, first of all, I didn't have a specific example to share with you today about sort of lethal autonomy. Um, we are actually working on a program in that space, confronting ethical, legal, and societal issues head on, so stay tuned. Um, I expect that there'll be announcements coming out within the next few months. Um, and then the other thing is, um, if you are interested in engaging with us in our broad vision of scaling LC across all DARPA programs, um, you can either send an email uh, you can scan the code or send an email to elsie at darpa.mil. Um, we are actually in the process of, of bringing on contract um, a nonprofit or organization that would allow us to maintain, you know, essentially a, um, a stable, a council of, of people who are available on call to help our program managers from program conception and then actually be able to embed themselves at any level of, of kind of LC intensity um, throughout the life cycle of the programs, and for that we want to be reaching across the country um, to people who are with, with various perspectives, levels of expertise, and of course passion for the problem. So thank you for your time and attention, and I would love to answer questions. Or do we have time? Am I, did I run out of time? Okay. Uh, good morning, ma'am. I'm Tech Sergeant Anthony Tucker from AFSOC A2. I had a question about URSA. So if the enemy decides to change their tactics, techniques, and procedures in order to fool the system into thinking that they are friendly, how does the system update its uh, algorithm? Would it have to be through a user providing feedback to the programmers, or would the system automatically notice that behavior and um, start to look and investigate into that? I think that it's a little bit of both, because the system is often noting things that the humans haven't, but then the humans still have to engage in order to help understand the implications. So we actually just did a, a massive concluding exercise, like a capstone exercise, working with um, a reserve mil military um, police brigade. And you know, they were dealing with detain you know, sort of massive detainee situations. And one of the things they noted was that the, the um, unmanned systems we're noting things like missing detainees and people who were in the wrong location much um, quicker than the humans were, but then once the humans were notified, they could make decisions, and then you can see how you feed that information back into updating um, the, the tactics and techniques. Copy. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello. Thank you so much for your amazing presentation. I'm Michael, and I study here at USF studying cybersecurity. My question is, how will you be implementing quantum computation once our silicon-based computers become obsolete in the data structures that aid government-generated programs? You may regret asking that question because you're about to get me on a little bit of a soapbox. Um, so, so DARPA actually has a couple of very interesting programs in quantum computing, and they are all founded on the premise that it is absolutely not clear whether quantum computing will be of any use at all. Um, right? There is, there is clearly some benefit in factoring algorithms, and there has been a lot of speculation on many other applications. But even with the factoring algorithms, we are not it is not clear how close we are to achieving a um, utility scale quantum computer, which is one that actually operates at a scale where you get more out of it than you have to put into it um, to actually you know, sort of have practical utility. So we have a program called Quantum Benchmarking, which is exploring um, these questions of just utility across um, all of those many, many promised quantum um, uh, quantum applications, you know, whether it has to do with uh, modeling and simulation of new materials or, you know, discovery and, and solving of complex problems. There's a lot of promise, but it is not actually clear that we know how to interpret the various technical breakthroughs happening in the quantum computing space to actual sense of whether those things are going to lead to something useful. We don't even know if the things we have been measuring, like the number of interacting qubits, are in fact the right metric to be paying any attention to. So, um, so I'm going to pause it to answer your question that we are actually not as close to being able to answer that question yet because we don't even know what the utility of the quantum computers will be. Um, we are also making a lot of investments in industry because this is one of those technical areas where the government is actually not the major driver. Um, there are a lot of closed inv industry investments, and we are trying to make sure that we are connecting with them so that there are, again, no, not a lot of, we don't want technological surprise, right? We would very much like to be able to um, have an understanding of when those breakthroughs are going to occur, when and how they would scale, and what the government's and the Department of Defense's role would be in being able to engage with and, and take advantage of those capabilities. So. Thank you for that, though. I, uh, um, when I first got back to DARPA, I got a long lecture on quantum computing, and so I, have, I have become the converted, and I'm trying to make sure I'm getting that, get that message out to everybody. So, next. Hi, Colty at USF. Um, we are working on testing and verifying connected autonomous vehicles in general, and we are looking, one of the things we are looking is cybersecurity. The other thing is testing how ethical they are. So since the theme of this conference is all, all talking about like ethical issues, um, as a human being, I think we look at the brain, how the brain works. So in hard decision or in situation like critical situations, we cannot even be ethical. So how do you think autonomous vehicles or autonomous systems, they can be tested or they can be developed to be ethical? Yeah, I think, I mean, you're really getting at the fundamental crux of the question, and I think that this is one of the things that, for example, that in the moment program is really wrestling with, is that when you have these very high pressure situations, and sometimes the, the, the answer as to what the ethical decision was will be disagreed upon by various people is one of those things we need to wrestle with up front. And I think it, it involves, you know, one, laying down um, the agreed upon norms testing aggressively in lots of situations, and then you know, constant feedback in order to understand what that sort of societal consensus might be. I mean, I think the, the point to remind ourselves over and over again is that we accept really horrendous decisions from humans because they are humans, um, and we have to ask ourselves a little bit about what, what the costs are to the things that we are we are comfortable accepting, right? So in the self-driving car situation, I, you know, I'm sure everyone has heard the arguments that despite some of the really dumb mistakes self-driving cars are making, 
the really dumb mistakes that humans make all the time, um, and the number of automobile accidents and pedestrians who are being wiped out. My home state of Colorado is in the process of setting a new record for um, pedestrian deaths um, from automobile accidents. Um, you can't lose sight of the cost of not actually tackling some of these hard new problems. So I don't have an easy answer for you. I think a lot of what I'm talking about, and I think you're already doing, is the methodology and the willpower to keep driving ourselves forward and not shying away from really hard questions. Hello, Dr. Tompkins. Uh, my name is Caitlin Lee from RAND Corporation, and I had a question for you about lethal autonomous weapons. I know you mentioned that program is just getting off the ground. But I wanted to ask you sort of your personal opinion or perspective as we think about auton lethal autonomous weapons and the ethics piece. Is your kind of going, do you have a view or a going in position about whether, when we think of the ethical piece, whether it's more important to focus on, for example, like algorithm development and thinking about, you know, the, the conditions and, and factors that will drive the algorithm development to sort of build in the ethics? Or do, or do you think the governance framework piece is really the way to go? Like the LLM exists, the algorithms do what they do, and so there's like a need for policy governance. So it's a little bit, and I know that I'm creating a totally binary framework sure. here, but I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Like how much of it is it about like the software development as we go and being thoughtful there versus government coming in and sort of providing some context and, and policy on it? If you have thoughts, I'd be really interested. So it's a, it's a really good question, of course, and it's a hard one to answer you know, easily. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume, I'm going to rely on the sophistication of the audience to, under, you know, to sort of tolerate some nuance here. Um, and I think you know, I'm going to say the answer really has to be both. Um, but what you don't need are the government to come in with draconian detail by detail guidelines, um, detail rules. What you need are the right guidelines that then allow those more bottoms up processes in the algorithm development to sort of explore that space. And you may need regular iteration. Um, an example of, you know, I don't want to go into detail of the program because it's not fully approved and it is not yet, you know, we could, we still could choose not to do it. We're kind of in the decision space, but we're going in with the fundamental premise that, that what we do will be driving to zero false alarms. Nope, not, no circumstances, zero false alarms. And we're gonna go as hard as we can towards that, what probably is a crazy goal, without stepping, without any you know, gray space. And then from that, I think we will learn what the gray space may have to be and whether or not we are even willing to tolerate such gray space. And I think that without kind of that balance of putting in some really hard rules, but only a few, allowing a lot of flexibility and learning and testing around that space and then adjusting the rules a little bit, I'm not sure how else, else we would do it. Um, and that's a interesting question that of course everyone who's worried about large language models is probably facing as well, right? Exactly how much top down, how much bottoms up yeah. when you don't want either of them running completely wild. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good morning. This is Norma Alcantar, I'm the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Engineering. My question is about faculty that would like to apply for a project in DARPA. It's very intimidating. And uh, now, um, did you recommend that they also had to worry about the ethical implications of their high risk, high impact idea? Or that's something that they should just uh, presented and DARPA already has all of these different uh, policy makers that yeah. will worry about it. So I just wanted to know a little bit of, you know, a sense of what recommendations you can give to faculty that would like to engage more with DARPA. Absolutely. Well, the short answer to your question is it is our job. Um, we, we have much more insight into all of the major issues and to the stakeholders and to the problems. We would not expect faculty members to have to be experts on that. That is definitely my program manager's job. The slightly longer answer to your question, because you're absolutely right, writing DARPA proposals can be really intimidating, especially for first timers, is that uh, we recognize that and we have put into place a whole bunch of um, new initiatives to try to make that easier. So. The first one is come to my DARPA 101 talk tomorrow because we're doing a lot of outreach events like this where we're, we're engaging with faculty directly. Um, but we also started something called DARPA Connect. So DARPA Connect at DARPA.mil. Send an email, they'll put you on the mailing list and there's a, there's a website, I don't have it here but I'll have it tomorrow. Um, and if you just Google DARPA Connect, it'll, it'll come up. Um, we have essentially 
are working with a partner nonprofit to set up a website that is meant to be your one-stop help desk for how to work with DARPA. Everything from tutorials on how to help write a proposal, how to diagnose a BAA, how to talk to a program manager, all of those sort of subtle things, and then lots of live um, events that are much more immediate. You know, DARPA just released a BAA in topic X. Let's all get together online and analyze the BAA and, and make sure that people understand what's being asked for and how to write a good proposal, right? So we're gonna do a bunch of things like that that we hope will help lower the barrier to entry. Just getting started, so be patient with us in terms of the website. Um, it is still very much under development, but it is there and um, available both for you to use and also to provide feedback on. Thanks for that question. So it was a perfect lead in for me to advertise what's coming next and I think to get off the stage, right? All right, so thank you. Well, Dr. Tompkins, let me echo our student. Thank you for that truly amazing presentation, enlightenment and information. And folks, when the director of DARPA says, contact us, we wanna work with you, guess what? She better be getting a lot of USF EDU emails on her inbox uh, to do that. So we will now take a break. Please be back with us at 1015 sharp to welcome our morning panel on the future of uncrewed systems, the benefits and dangers of advanced technology. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome back. We're ready to get started with our morning panel, which will examine the future of uncrewed systems, the benefits and dangers of advancing technology. We're pleased to have with us here from USF, Dr. Armand Sargulziai as our panel moderator. Dr. Sargulziai is the director of the Resilient Autonomous Network Control Systems Research Group and assistant professor in the Advanced Air Mobility Research Program at the Center for Urban Transportation Research at the University of South Florida. His expertise is in applying linear and non-linear non control method machine learning and artificial intelligence in the field of network control systems. His mission is to enhance the quality of life for people by assuring the safety, security, and privacy concerns through extensive collaboration among multidisciplinary fields. He is a recipient of the NSF Career Award for his research on testing and verifying security of the connected and autonomous vehicles. Now I'll turn over the discussions to my friend, Dr. Salgol Ziai, who will introduce the panel speakers facilitate the discussion, and lead the question and answer session that follows. Sarmanja. Hey, good morning, everyone. So thanks for coming and joining and spending your hours in the morning with us. Um, I had a conversation with the panelists, and I said that I'm not a morning person, and this is the earliest I woke up during past several months. So I hope that we can make it engaging and we can have a good time and we can have a lot of discussions with each other. So I uh, first introduce our panelists. They are great panelists. I actually watched some of their talks on YouTube by myself and I enjoyed their conversation, the way they lead the conversations. So I'm, uh, it's my pleasure to have them here. I will introduce them, and then after that, I'll give a few minutes to every of them, each of them, to uh, give initial remarks. And then hopefully after that, we have some questions that I'm going to ask some questions, and then we'll uh, give some time to you guys to ask questions as well. So first, I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Lux. Um, Mr. Lux is the executive director of Assure. Uh, it's, uh, Alliance for System Safety of UAS through Research Excellence, led by Mississippi State University. Mr. Lux is responsible for leading the alliance of 23 of the world's, world's uh, leading research universities. Actually, it's 23 here, but I talked to him today and he said it's 29 uh, research universities that they are working together. And also industrial partners. Mr. Lux is an Air Force uh, veterans with over 2,500 hours flying times. 
with, uh, while on exchange with the U.S. Navy, including 700 in, uh, hours combat time in operation over Iraq, Bosnia, and Afghanistan. Uh, Mr. Lux uh, received his Bachelor's of Science degree in Computer Science and commissioned from the U.S. Air Force Academy in 1984. He retired from the Air Force in 2014 from his last assignment at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, Daytona Beach, where he commanded the uh, Re Reserve Officers Training Program. He is a distinguished graduate of both the USAF Fighter Weapon School and Air, Air Command and Staff College. With that, I'll give a few minutes to Mr. Lux to uh, give initial remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. Uh, and thank you for uh, attending this morning and for uh, GNSI for putting this uh, great opportunity uh, together for us. So in my current role of uh, at Assure, uh, we're focused on applied research. And uh, the, all those universities and our industry partners came together to serve as the FAA Center of Excellence for, um, for unmanned aircraft systems. What we'll probably get into a little bit today on that portion of it all is the opportunity and risk associated with the FAA. A lot of great discussion, fantastic technologies, but unless we're pulling the FAA along with us, it's not going to happen here in the United States. And I can have, <clears throat> I'll talk later on, hopefully, counter UAS, uh, new technologies going nowhere in the United States until we get the FAA on board. Um, we also support NASA in applied research and looking at different technologies. A lot of focus going on in the, in the uh, communications spectrum area, uh, issues associated with that, multi-aircraft control, command and control uh, kind of issues uh, associated with that. And then Assure recently has, has gone out to develop uh, a federated system of uh, standards, uh, training, testing, uh, exercises to support first responders' use of uh, UAS and ultimately be the credentialing authority for uh, first responders' use of that for law enforcement, fire, and um, emergency management system, emergency systems, and then the different uh, emergency management agencies at the federal, state, and local level. So with that, I'll just kind of leave it there and we can talk more later. Sure. Sounds great. So the next speaker that I would like to introduce to you is Dr. Jared Riddick. He is a senior fellow at Georgetown University Center for Security and Emerging Technology. Prior to joining CSET, he was a principal uh, director for autonomy in the office of the Under Security Secretary for Research and Engineering, serving as a senior DOD official for coordination strategy and transition of autonomy research and development. He also uh, served in the executive leadership role in the U.S. Um, Army Research Lab, where he established a 200-acre robotic research collaboration campus. He has also served in the leadership roles in the office of the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Research and Technology and the former office of the Under Secretary of Defense for Accusation, Technology, and Logistics. He holds a PhD in Engineering Mechanics from Virginia Tech, Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering from North Carolina a and State University, and Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Howard University. With that, I'll give a few minutes to him to give his initial remarks. Thank you. <clears throat> so thanks uh, to everyone for being here. So I am uh, from the Center for Security uh, and Emerging Technology, or CSET as we call it. And the CSET exists at the intersection of national security um, and emerging technology policy. So I want to really thank GNSI for um, putting on this event and really um, highlight the importance of having this type of institute in an academic environment. Um, you know, part of our goal at CSET is to train the next generation of technical policy experts. And so having this type of institute in an academic setting really gives you an opportunity to participate in that objective. So, so uh, kudos to you for that. I'll just use my few minutes here to do a, a bit of scene setting. Um, you know, I left the DOD uh, to go to this think tank in December. Um, so in January of this year, the big, big discussion was around innovation adoption. And for the, uh, the Atlantic, Council, Atlantic Council put together a commission actually 
on innovation adoption, and I love their slogan. It was that DOD does not have an innovation problem, it has an innovation adoption problem. So really thinking about the fact that commercial technology coming from non-traditional um, DOD partners is where a lot of the, the new technologies that we're seeing have an impact on warfare are being developed. And DOD now has to figure out how do we get those commercial technologies into being capability? That's a big conversation within DOD, certainly at the beginning of the year. And so back then, I, in around February, I wrote a commentary that appears in Issues in Science and Technology. Um, and it's really in response to an article that came from the South Korean, um, some South Korean defense experts who were saying that um, they have a problem in South Korea that their defense R&D sector is closed. And so they're concerned, based on what they're seeing in Ukraine, about how will they bring commercial technology into uh, South Korean uh, capability. And when I saw that commentary, I said, well, that sounds familiar. And so the, the, the commentary, the, the response I wrote in Issues in Technology really says innovation adoption now becomes a, a potential way for us to uh, collaborate with international partners. And so we heard a lot yesterday about foreign military sales um, and how we engage foreign partners there. But there's also um, a po possibility now as we innovate around how we're going to adopt technology to engage international partners in how they're thinking about those problems too. So a, a bit more scene setting, um, at the beginning of the summer, there was a legislative proposal that was announced for um, a proposed joint autonomy office. And that really um, sort of caught my attention, um, announced by a, a, a bipartisan team of Congress per persons. Uh, there was a lot of pushback to that. And um, so that legislative proposal really um, is not in the NDAA, but there is some appropriation language in, in the Senate Appropriations Bill about an, an, a role that's, that's sort of similar, um, asking CDAO to set up a, an autonomy enterprise platform. So I've written a blog post about that. Uh, it's on the CSET website now, talking about um, these announcements in the context of the now late summer announcement for Replicator. And we talked a bit about Replicator yesterday. I'm going to talk some more about that today. But in my blog post, I, I basically lay out the proposal that if we're wildly successful with this Replicator effort, and two years from now, we have fielded thousands of drones in multiple domains, um, what then comes next? And perhaps these legislative proposals that came from Congress earlier in the year, and what exists now in the Senate Appropriations Bill gives us a path forward. Um, so I want to spend the time today talking about those things, but also there's one other pitch that I want to make. Um, as we talk about policy, I think there's a real need for balance. And there have been a few articles that have come out recently, one from Klein Kitchens at AEI, uh, another from the uh, Carnegie uh, Endowment for Peace, where folks are sort of making the point that we don't want to have policy at the expense of innovation. And I want to spend some time on that as we talk today. And I think we heard a little bit of that yesterday. But there is a real need for balance. And I have a concern that the policy conversation um, has been uh, really sort of uh, dominated by these issues around dangers, hazards, and bias, which are important. But we have to be very careful that we don't miss the opportunity for innovation and that we don't handcuff ourselves in terms of the technology that we want to have for the future warfighter. That's nice. So actually, it was really interesting what you mentioned. So I talked with Mr. Vox in the morning as well, and he was mentioning exactly the same thing, that instead of looking and talking about all the dangers and all the problems, why we are not looking at like benefits and why we are not focusing on that. We will get to that hopefully soon. That's great. So the next speaker that I want to introduce is Dr. Jennifer McCardell. Uh, she is an adjunct senior fellow in the defense uh, program and warm ga gaming lab at the Center for a New American Security. She is also the senior director for defense programs and the deputy chief learning officer at CAS USA and non-resident fellow at the Joint Special Operations University. Her present research, her present research focus, focus on military readiness training and defense technical innovation. Dr. McCardell has served on the Congressman Langevin, Langevin's Cyber Advisory Committee and as an expert member of a NATO technical group that develops cyber effect, effects for the military alliance campaign simulations. She holds a PhD from King's College London 
in war studies, is the recipient of the uh, uh, Red Fred Lewis Doctoral Scholarship in Modeling and Simulation and a Certified Modeling and Simulation Professional. She is a term member uh, with the Council on Foreign Relation, Relationship, Relations and was named um, an official math science by the U.S. Army Training and uh, Doctrine Command. With that, I'll give a few minutes for her to come up with the initial remarks. Well, th thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you so much to G uh, GNSI. This has been a phenomenal conference, and I'm really honored to, to be here today with you all. So what I'd like to do is, in my short amount, of op short amount of time for these opening remarks, is kind of pull on a couple threads that were starting to come out yesterday. So one is on human-machine teaming, and the second is on trust. So we focused a lot on um, uncrewed systems and RPVs in much in a kind of aerial context. And when we talk about human-machine teaming, it's much bigger than that. So off, obviously, you know, it can manifest in, what, in ways like that we're seeing in Ukraine. It can manifest like a fighter pilot um, flying alongside a loyal wingman or a collaborative combat aircraft. It can also manifest in very different ways. So for instance, we can be using AI as a teammate in a command and control center where it's providing a um, decision support to a commander. We could also theoretically see AI AIs emerge as kind of in synthetic instructors providing training to our future um, guardians, airmen, sailors, soldiers. So essentially human machine teaming can take multiple different types of shapes and forms. And when we think about the future of human machine teaming, and as the military begins to rely more and more on human machine teams, trust becomes so incredibly important. So at present, when we think about trusted autonomy, we're oftentimes thinking about this from a technical level. What is the technical solutions that will allow us to make um, autonomous systems more transparent, explainable, or reliable? But simply looking at this from a technology-based solution, it ignores the human element of that problem. And so I would start by saying that if we want to start to understand human machine teaming from a trust context, we should be thinking about what human-to-human -human trust looks like in a military context. And at present, you know, in the military, trust is based on predictability. It's born of training and professionalism. And there's also this fundamentally emotional component to it because it's a willingness to cede your vulnerability to another in environments of danger, uncertainty, and risk. And since trust has this emotional element to it, and since it's linked to predictability and understanding, there are ways to start to build and understand trust in what are called synthetic environments. So there, these are these virtual and constructive simulated worlds. So constructive as in computer generated worlds. And we typically use these virtual worlds for training and we can obviously use them for other applications like experimentation and trust development. So for instance, um, uh, the company that I'm involved in right now, we are using various physiological sensors to understand a person's emotive state in real time. So we can measure things like tr um, stress levels. That data can then be used to build these models that are these attributes of trust where we can start to understand human to human trust and build a model around it. Those same models can then be applied to human machine teams and we can start to refine those models in different nuanced ways. Since predictability is tied to trust, the ability to run through multiple scenarios in faster than real time or in real time within these synthetic environments can allow humans to better understand their machine partners and vice versa for machine teammates to better understand the human that they're working with. And if you're using these simulated environments, you're naturally reducing risk because that trust building process is happening in a virtual simulated world. It's not a live environment. And um, so I would just like, I just wanted to start with that. So when we think about trust, there's all these different ways to do it. And I'm hoping that will kind of start to frame the discussion. Thanks a lot. So I think uh, trust is really one of the things that we want to discuss today as well, like, as, um, like along with policy challenges and also benefits and some of the dangers of uh, advancing technology. So with that, I'll start with the first question. It's a general question, and it's going to be for all the panelists. 
I would say, how do you see the future of uncrewed systems in general, like where we are right now and where we are going to be in the future as far as the uncrewed systems? And with that, I'll start with maybe Jennifer. Um, so, you know, like I was saying, I would, I, I think it's smart when we're thinking about uncrewed systems to try to open that kind of aperture of analysis for the different ways these human machine teams can manifest. Human machine teams are gonna touch every single element of military operations because essentially we're thinking about artificial intelligence as a way to augment military operations today and intelligent operations for that matter. And one of the key things to think about when we're talking about AI is it's fundamentally enabler. It is like electricity. It can enable all sorts of things we do within a military context. So we can think about the use of AI to help intelligence intelligence analysts gather information to produce intelligence reports to red team those reports. Within a command and control center, we can have you know, AI acting as a, um, as a decision support tool where it can be going through information, calling it, presenting that information in a way that's much more reliable um, for the military commander and it helps the commander grapple with things like information overload. Obviously, we can see it being used in different constructs. So already we are using um, robotic tools to, you know, to work alongside soldiers to carry, you know, tons and tons of weight um, when they're forward deployed. You could see them, you know, operating alongside airmen as a loyal wingman. I mean, essentially anything you could think about, we can see there's, there are applications for human machine teams. So I honestly just think like, it's just, we're limited by our own creativity. Yeah, and I think, um to follow on, I think we've seen um, for a very long while that any strategic document that you read that comes from uh, DOD sort of professes that in the future, um, uncrewed systems, autonomous systems will be ubiquitous um, in the battlefield environment. We're seeing in Ukraine um, the adoption of, of uh, you know, s sort of uh, systems and technology that, that were not in, in uh, fr frequent use before this conflict started. And so this really is an opportunity for everyone um, sort of looking on to sort of see things in different scenarios, gather data. Um, and prior to that, we saw a great demonstration yesterday of all of the sort of uh, systems that have sort of uh, been introduced, particularly on the, the, the UAV side. And so, you know, this is an expanding space. And um, I think for anyone who is uh, either not paying attention or doubting uh, where this is going, um, you know, it's clear now that, that you will be left behind. And so I think we see now moves to get out in front of this. Uh, I, I mentioned replicator before, and I'll mention it again and again. Uh, I don't want to be noun verb replicator, but I think that, um, you know, what that announcement means um, to the, the, the sort of the future posture is really important. What it means to industry folks, I mean, the day that the announcement was made, I think it was August 28th, um, I knew of, that it was coming a day before, and I started calling people and saying, have you heard about this? And, and people saying, no, I hadn't heard, I hadn't heard. Uh, but the day after, everyone had heard, and everyone was sort of, uh, sort of making adjustments. And so um, I think the, the, the question now that I'm uh, beginning to explore, and I, I think we're going to have some things that come out from CSAT on this, we've, we've put out a few pieces already, is really about sort of manufacturing capacity. So once you understand uh, the objective that has been very clearly stated by the Deputy Secretary of Defense, uh, once at the NDIA conference on the 28th and then a few days later in a follow-up um, at a meeting that was sponsored by Defense News, you understand the objective, then um, you can start to sort of uh, uh, peel back the layers on uh, what cost looks like and, and how many will buy. Then the question is, well, who will we buy it from? Who can actually um, sort of uh, 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 fit the bill. And we're seeing some conversation about that. I think um, we've seen the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment, Dr. LaPlante, make some statements about manufacturing capacity. Uh, there are a few other articles that have come out very recently. Um, and so I, we're, we're starting to look there. But I think that, you know, it's a foregone conclusion. Um, another example is the um, the Ar Armenian conflict with the Ar 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 Azerbaijanis, I always get that, that wrong when I try to say it, um, you know, which the former ARL chief scientist refers to as the drone war. Um, Alex Cott has put out a few articles on 
you know, how prevalent the use of drones uh, was in that conflict and, and what it meant and the sort of the change um, uh, that it meant for, for warfare in what was known as the uh, Nagano-Karbakh uh, conflict. And so, so we've seen um, now this sort of uh, increase, and I think it was forecast in strategy documents, and we're here. Um, and I think it will only grow more as we go forward, in all domains, by the way, not just UAVs. I'd like to add to that, um, actually less read than my two uh, PhD colleagues here, but from my operational experience in 2001, I had the opportunity to stand up our, um, our country's first armed UAV capability uh, in, in Afghanistan, Iraq, and various other locations around the globe. And at that time, that was it. We, and then we had a couple ISR orbits. And so that was 20 years ago. Look where we are today. So just taking the, the growth, although it probably should move much, much faster, moving very well in the military applications because the mission is so important. Uh, we have a long ways to go in civil applications because it's difficult for the regulators to understand the trade-off, the benefit side of the house that they don't get any credit for. So we'll get, I'll, I'll get a little bit more into that later. And then following some of what Jen mentioned <clears throat> with the human machine interface as we kind of move forward, um, that's on the societal side. You know, where we start seeing UAS being used today is really purely as a sensor, not ISR sensor power line inspections, going up and down towers where you risk a lot less in life, you know, uh, of putting people up on those towers. And if you've ever seen a video of a power line inspection or seen the people actually getting out onto the wires and doing stuff, it's, it's crazy. And we, we have approximately 50 accidents a year doing power lines in, inspections when there's absolutely no need for that because it could be purely automated and moving on. Um, but then we move from that to doing some of those kind of human uh, machine interface working together on some of these tasks. And how does that look and how do we grow that? Um, and then society really needs to understand that some of these benefits, so it's not the drones that I flew that are spying on you, ready to shoot you with a missile, but as we move them out into first responders, so the society can see the benefit on your worst day, your house is on fire, your dog's lost in the woods. Um, um, you can get a search and rescue, uh, multiple drones flying out there to help uh, law enforcement or fire or rescue, uh, save, your, save your home, save your family, at least save life, if not property. Uh, we see this in wildfire fighting. Uh, probably the most risk, well, risk taking but risk averse to change is the fire jumpers who go in and work while firefighting because their life, just like the military, is at such risk that they count on their teammates. Uh, new technologies are seen uh, as very questionable till they can prove themselves, but there is a great opportunity to bring in where you're less concerned about losing a drone, but <clears throat> the, we gotta build confidence and trust in those kind of things. So societally, we, we have to kind of make that flip and show the whole of society that these uh, autonomous systems are generally a good thing. There's some real challenges, though. We talked a little bit yesterday, is this revolutionary or evolutionary? In some ways, like we're seeing with the strikes now, as we move to electric vehicles and changes in uh, electrification, automation, that our job structures and, and workforce has to be trained differently and adjusted. And then my final point that I wanna make on this is we're behind, and, and you know that already. Inherently, we are behind. I work uh, constantly trying to work uh, standards around the globe as a, as, a, as a response to China and where they are in this space. Uh, right now, the, the government has gone forward and said, hey, and, and many states have said, we will not have Chinese products flying around for very good reasons. But then you go to the U.S. industry, and it's not there. It, it doesn't have the sensors. It's, it's too expensive. So we have some serious catching up to do as we move forward. Um, 
and we got to overcome that challenge because if industry is not there, that's a national security risk that we have to fix. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that led that's to my next question, which is related to that. And I want to ask, uh, to what extent do you think UAV technology outpaced legislation? So we can start with Jennifer again from that part. So a lot of the advancements when it comes to um, autonomous systems are happening in the private sector. Um, they're moving, it's moving incredibly quickly and it's moving much faster, I'd say, than policy generally. And so there's, I guess, a few different ways to break this down. One is to look at policy around acquisitions. Another one is to look at policy around research and development. And then the final one, I think, is to look at policy around talent. Um, when we're thinking about what should we be doing from a policy standpoint to kind of maintain um, pace with our competitors. Um, Lux brought up China for an example. So one is the acquisition side. Um, anyone that's been in and around the defense beltway knows that um, one of, I think, the fa one of people's favorite things to do is to uh, bring up the acquisition system that is, of, as something that is this like Byzantine bureaucratic beast that's very difficult to work through. Um, there has been a lot of efforts to change that, to create these middle tiers of acquisitions that are meant to be much more, uh, much more easily, easy to use than traditional FAR based, so federal acquisition regulation, um, acquisition pathways. When we look at things like research and development funding, so rdt and &E funding, that is where I think a lot of the money will initially go to industry um, to do, to drive these future advancements in human machine teams and autonomous systems. And a lot of that money is early stage, basic and applied research. Now what's interesting is when you look at rdt &E funds, the majority of it, over 80%, is still FAR based. It's still based in federal acquisition regulations. Um, that is not because policy isn't there to provide people a vehicle, it's because our acquisition professionals haven't necessarily realized that those contract vehicles to take advantage of other transaction authorities are there. So we're starting to see that with um, the Army, on the cyber side, so at least when it comes to acquisitions, I think actually pathways do exist. This is an education problem and not necessarily a po policy problem now. So then if we talk about AI development and R&D spending, that's the next one I'd say that we need to be thinking about. In the next 10 years, China is going to be outspending us from a research and development standpoint when it comes to AI. That's just a fact. Now, the government has invested significant money in AI research and development. Uh, Eric Schmidt, I believe, he was talking to the last administration and they asked him how much should we spend on AI R&D. And he said to the government, double your spending, then double it again, then come and talk to me. This is the uh, Eric Schmitz with Google. And so we did put significant funding into AI, but we cut S&T funding at the same time. Now, if AI is an enabler, it's going to be enabling every single type of capability that we're talking about from a science and technology standpoint. So if we want to compete with China or with potential you know, other adversaries from an S&T and a research and development standpoint, we need to be upping research and development spending across the S&T enterprise and not just within AI. I'd say the third one comes down to talent. So the Chinese government has long prioritized scientific talent. They have this program called the Thousand Talents Program where they're trying to lure back Chinese students to China through incredible pay, bonuses, research funds, lab space, grants, all sorts of stuff. They recognize that talent is critical to compete with the US. Now during the Cold War, we used immigration policy as a way to compete against the Soviet Union. We need to be thinking very strategically about how we use immigration policy today as a competitive angle against the Chinese because they are thinking about that very, very strategically. And when you talk to AI-based scientists or AI, AI and ML scientists, they'll tell you that one of their biggest challenges when it comes to hiring is oftentimes immigration reform. Um, so getting things like J1s and things like that. So I'd say those are the three things we could be thinking about from a policy standpoint if we want to compete. Yeah, all really good. 
Um, I, I'm, and I was actually taking notes, so I'm just going to piggyback. I agree 110% with you on everything that you said, and especially the part about the innovation ecosystem um, and the fact that people hammer the acquisition um, process all the time. Um, the, the horse blanket, you know, people always show you that. I'm actually very fascinated with that process, and I think um, when Katrina McFarland was the acquisition executive of the Army, um, she addressed the entire sort of acquisition community in the Army and once said that, you know, there is, it is possible to innovate within the acquisition authority. It just takes a willing champion um, who's a senior person um, who has the understanding to do that. And I think we saw in the um, sort of administration of, of Ellen Lord when she was the acquisition executive for DOD, these sort of middle tier acquisition authorities and some more innovative things, um, really some innovative things on the software side, um, sort of what we refer to as this sort of BA8 funding and then some, some other sorts of, uh, of um, regulations that, that came out there and, and other transactional authorities. So there, there is plenty of, I think, uh, innovation on the acquisition side. Um, that, that can be done. But the critical thing, and there is a report that came out from CSET before I was there uh, that refers to this notion of ending innovation tourism, I think is the title. I think the critical thing is that the innovation ecosystem is completely separate from the acquisition and procurement um, chain of command. And so we've now stood up within DOD this very vast innovation ecosystem. I, I just uh, received recently a sort of a view of the org chart of all the innovation uh, ecosystem. And it doesn't go on an eight and a half by 11 sheet, it's a eight and a half by 14. I mean, it's very, very vast. And I looked at that and you know, in the context of innovation adoption thought, you know, for a non-traditional DOD partner that comes into one of these offices, has a great engagement and maybe even gets some funding, um, there is no pathway out of that to the top uh, that, that a, a small non-traditional company can even navigate. I mean, I know the pathways because I've been there for 20 years, but in a non-traditional partner. And then if you even navigate to the top, you're still not uh, talking to someone who has an acquisition authority. And so this is a critical problem. We have folks engaging us at DOD through this innovation ecosystem that is in many ways disconnected from the, 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 uh, the acquisition authority. So that is really the crux of innovation adoption. We have commercial partners that are, are doing this development. How do we now get them into the acquisition side? The other side of that, when I talk to these non-traditional business partners, um, who are doing amazing work and what, what they're really doing when they're maturing this technology outside of the traditional um, R&D space is they're de-risking. They're, they're, they're you know, buying down the risk um, for DOD that DOD used to have to uh, assume. Uh, but when they show up with this technology and I've asked many of them, how do you imagine that we'll buy that? I had one um, person from a venture-backed company tell me, well, if DOD really likes my product, they could just buy my company and own the company. And I said, well, you know, it doesn't work that way. And I tried to explain, and they said, well, you know, you don't understand, we're gonna find someone else to talk to. That's what they told me, like, we'll find someone else to talk to. So this, 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 this issue around innovation adoption really comes down to this, this separation and the funding that, 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 that Jennifer was referring to that's on the RDT and east side that's really not, not connected. On the talent side, this is a very, very critical issue, and, and clearly any data or statistics you look at will show that numbers-wise, we're, we're being outpaced by uh, capable near peer adversaries, particularly uh, China. Um, and you know there is a, a, a gap in the, the, the numbers of publications that are coming out, the number of graduates. And I was looking at that recently because, particularly, I'll just take one, one particular area, in nanotechnology, for example, the United States, uh, back around 2001, declared we're going to go, you know, full force into nanotechnology. And around that time, you know, nano was the big thing. Um, around 2003, there was legislation enacted. Uh, 2004, the National Nanotechnology Initiative was stood up. And if you look out, if you start to go further out, I found this report from Congressional um, Research Service that sort of declared by about 2014 or so. Uh, we had now invested about $19 billion, and that report says the United States is now a leader in nanotechnology. But if you look at the, the publications uh, in, in open literature, by that time, the U.S. does show uh, leadership, but the Chinese are far outstripping us, even uh, you know, back in 2014. But if you go further back, in 1987, the Chinese declared, we shall 
uh, make nanotechnology a, a priority. In 1997, they then declared we shall double down in nanomaterials um, and carbon nanotubes was a big area where they would focus. And so you see this, 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 this huge uptick. And it's really sort of a, a, on both sides an acknowledgement of the, the, the power of, of sort of national level decisions about how to invest. Um, but, you know, we are in a position where the, quali the quantity on the other side is, is, is uh, uh, um, challenging. But we have to really double down in, in quality. Right, and this is where um, we have shown leadership uh, in our in, in the history. Our legacy is around innovation, um, and and as we think about sort of upping the numbers, I think we have to very uh, steadily maintain an eye on quality because that is where we'll win. We may not ever win in quantity, and that's just a, a you know a numbers game, um, but we we do have the the. Um, the, the history, really, the legacy of leading in quality. So when we look at these great commercial firms that are doing this great work, we need to find a way to support them. We need to find a way to bring their, cap their technology and its capability because that's the quality advantage. And that's what we will always maintain, in my opinion, as we go forward. Um, so yes, I mean, legislation is behind. And I think, um, I, I think that in terms of legislation, I, I do sometimes worry um, that you know these new uh, issues coming before legislative bodies that uh, may not be technology experts and may not have uh, that, that necessary expertise, but are under pressure now to do something. Do something. We've got to have legislation, and this gets back to this whole issue of we've got to we've got to lock it down. We've got to ban it. We've got to control it. And I th I hope that we think uh, measure twice and cut once as we do this. Because if we put things in place that handcuff us early on, um, they'll be hard to fix later on. And we will miss windows of opportunity because we have limited ourselves, even if we fix it somewhere down the road. I'll stop there. Thank you. So <clears throat> I'll take a, take a slightly uh, different track here. <clears throat> and before I start on it, uh, I own this problem. John me and the Assure organization that works uh, to support uh, the FAA, NASA, the government, and then industry in general. But we have a, at the regulatory level, we have a leadership problem. Um, well, and I'll start with the FAA has not have an administrator uh, that's been approved by Congress for over a year and a half. Uh, people are bailing out the doors, interim uh, leaders are coming and going, they're focused more on their next opportunities, but there's a strong core inside the FAA in particular that really does want to try to make things happen, but the bureaucracy is heavy. And it's very, very difficult for the FAA currently to move uh, risk-averse organization um, anyway, right, they want to keep it very important, they, and they'll tell you, we have the safest uh, airspace system in the whole of the United States and uh, the world, and uh, safety has to come first. <clears throat> so what that has created, and as uh, there's many, some military in the room and um, others, you know, leaderships, uh, leaders make decisions understanding the mission and risk. Your attorneys, your general counsel, minimize risk. They look at a problem from a, a risk-based solution. And what has happened inside the FAA, it's being driven by their general counsel to everything that's currently going on in the FAA. So a decision moves forward, everybody waits for what general counsel says, and we, we stop. Whatever general counsel says happens. So just to give a little vignette with that uh, on kind of how crazy this situation has <clears throat> come, Congress has uh, given the FAA uh, to, to, for sure, the research organization, our researchers, our industry partners, to go and work with DHS, uh, where DHS is more looking at the efficacy of counter UAS systems, where are they good, where are they bad, you know, how to integrate them into our airspace system. Uh, but the FAA's role is, well, what's the effect on the national airspace? Precision timing, navigation, communications, other aircraft, as these systems are employed, and, and until we know that, 
those systems are not going to be allowed to be used in the national airspace system. So this project has been laid on. We started exercising. We went to uh, Alaska to do a pretty intensive uh, DHS uh, work, including some DOD. And the FAA shut, shut down our participation and that our portions of the exercise because the general counsel said the FAA has no author current authorities to conduct counter UAS. Of course they don't. DHS does. That's why we have coordinated with DHS to do it. And there was not the leadership to kind of push through this problem. Uh, so these are the kind of challenges. We have immense talent out there. We just have to get it employed. And then also, at the regulatory level, get people who are smart, who are uh, you know, the program managers, to come out so they can teach their bosses that the old way of doing things, uh, you know, understanding safety are, 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 can be done in different ways to achieve same levels of safety in the future. So that's a huge one. So what are we doing to fix this problem? Well, fortunately, the administration has nominated a new uh, administrator, and by all looks, uh, this, this looks like it will be a, a good leader who can, who can come in. Uh, Congress is pushing for the FAA to reorganize and readjust so it can handle new emergent technologies, including space launch and recovery, uh, these counter UAS systems, the high altitude uh, um, uh, pseudo satellites, all these kind of things are coming on and we're kind of frozen in regulation and they're all currently one offs, which again, not good for national security, not good for our military, because you, it's so hard to get up there or back down that we have difficulties. Mo moving into autonomy, how do you certify autonomy? Uh, current systems, particularly in DOD, you have a long process of you know, really running software through its, through its legs. But as you look at some of these new UAS systems, they're primarily software. So how do we certify a system and then quickly make changes versus waiting three years when we have known problems with the system that the FAA is not ready to accept that autonomy? Uh, so we're working on some of those. So what are we doing? Uh, we, we, the, that strong inner core group that really does want change has been working with the shore, been working with Congress to be appropriated funds to actually start tackling these tough uh, issues. Will the FAA accept them? We don't know the leadership and, and the rule writers actually accept them. We brought in <coughs> um, the Center for Air and Space Law out of uh, Ole Miss uh, University to actually look at gaps in law, to work with Congress on, especially in the counter UAS, with wiretap, pin trap, uh, Title 18 issues and privacy issues. Uh, they're also helping us on all our projects so we can give standards groups and give uh, leadership a cut on language so that we, we're not just giving them the data, but we can actually do uh, some, some language. Those are the steps moving forward, but um, I'm extremely concerned on, on the pace. And uh, Congress is also uh, even portions of the White House have also expressed concern, but to try to move this forward is, uh, is going to take a lot of pressure from society. What's holding up the FAA and the leadership and general counsel is they don't know where our citizens sit in the nation. Their comfort and trust in these systems. And so they overregulate, they overprotect because they don't want the lash out of our society. So the more we can continue even in operations to generate trust, to get out the information of how autonomy is helping, the uh, UAS is helping, in the Florida uh, hurricane that just recently happened, we had worked for well over a year working with Florida Power and Light to get their waivers and certifications to fly the power lines for inspections after a disaster. And in the event, uh, Florida Power and Light actually executed. There was one situation where one small UAS that they were following up the big ones that were moving up and down the, the power lines quickly to look at something. It hit a generator and kind of took out power to a community. Of course, that hit the press right away, but it only lasted for a couple hours in the cycle because within uh, just over 24 hours, 
they had well over 90 percent of the power back in, in Florida because they were able to respond much better to the new information. So it's those kind of stories that we got to work to communicate much better so our society understands the civil applications, the military applications, how it saves lives, how it's approving things. It's not perfect. Don't ever expect it to be perfect, but it is, you know, somehow to what level uh, is it improving things going forward? Thank you. Yeah, it was a great conversation. So now I would love to open the floor for audiences to ask questions. Hello, thank you for your time. Uh, that was some very deep thoughts that I probably would have never come up my, with myself. I ask you, how will you bridge the digital divide with autonomous vehicles for folks like farmers, electricians, plumbers, or sustainable meat uh, production and renewable energy? Uh, I mean, if any of you guys want to answer that, so that would be nice. So, uh, when you are asking questions, please, I mean, introduce yourself, and if you have a question from a specific panelist, you mention it, otherwise, we'll just ask panelists to answer. Mike up, yeah. So, UAS offers, it's one of the great equalizers. Why, why uh, countries like Australia with the huge outback uh, like Appalachia is is putting a ton of money and effort into funding. While I'm at um, Mississippi State is a lead university for sure, so I get to see what they're doing in precision ag. All these things will, uh, it, it, you know, it's not the delivery of your pizza, although there's much more money there probably, or your delivery of a, you know, a, you're out fishing and you need new bait or some beers. It's, it's not that that excites me it's the most. It's in those areas that you just talked about. Precision ag, better ways to uh, manage crops and then also not over fertilize or pesticides and things like that. It, it's, it's amazing the level of improvement and I'm not an expert in this area. I just, they show me the charts and how much they're able to produce and the costs decreasing because they're not doing it. And then we don't have the runoff into streams and you know poisoning you know streams and fish and other wildlife, so those things I think are going to be the a big part of the impetus uh, to, to kind of help us get over with society. It's just harder for society to kind of see some of those things. That's why the big push with the first responders, and I'm I'm less although we work with New York uh, Fire and Police and Cal Fire and these big, big organizations, our biggest concern is how do we get to the whole of the rural United States when you're just one small police department and fire department across the county, how do we get these kind of systems in there so they, they, can, they can leverage all those kind of capabilities? But I, I think that is being, that is a very primary area that's being already addressed. to a, a little bit of what I was talking about earlier and balance in policy, right? Um, the, I wrote down this quote, uh, Ashley Lawrence, who's a vice president at Microsoft and used to be at Johns Hopkins um, Applied uh, APL, J, J, APL um, recently was uh, in a panel where he said, if our collective work in AI and society stops at mitigating harms, then we're really leaving a lot on the table for historically disadvantaged communities. And so, if you are a jobs, jobs, jobs person, um, we're in a very interesting moment because we have the, the really explosion of technologies, and I see those through the lens uh, that, that I'm accustomed to in DOD when we talk about critical technologies, emerging technologies. The Undersecretary of Defense and Research and Engineering has a list of 14 of those. But think about what uh, is happening right now in the Chips and Science Act. Uh, this is strictly for microelectronics, which is one of the technologies on that list of 14. Um, you know, Congress has appropriated $20 billion to do um, place-based innovation hubs around the nation, right? And this is simply, this is strictly in the area of microelectronics. But what that will do, or gives the possibility to do, 
is to think about um, areas around the nation that have been uh, you know, less included, um, uh, under invested areas where you could take these types of, of place-based innovations and technology and really you know, change the complexion of communities. And we've seen that. Um, you know, years ago when the National Robotics and Engineering Center started uh, in Pittsburgh, it was started by Carnegie Mellon. Uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania gave them a track of land in a sort of uh, you know, deserted area in Pittsburgh, um, a small federal grant. 25 years later, um, the National Robotics and Engineering Center is the centerpiece of Robotics Row in Pittsburgh. And we know this is a dense collection of robotics companies that is the envy of the world. Um, that neighborhood, the Lawrenceville neighborhood, is the hottest real estate market in Pittsburgh. The uh, income in that neighborhood increased threefold, 61% increase in um, population in, in that neighborhood. And when I visited there um, not too long ago, I was being given a, a tour, and the tour guide kept saying everything, or, no, these were rusted out steel mills, he kept saying. And I said, well, where were the rusty, rusty steel mills? Because when you go there now, you see these gleaming buildings. There are all these um, uh, in innovative companies there. And, um, you know, he said all of it. This was all deserted. And I, it's really hard to believe. But over the course of 25 years, you saw this incredible transformation of, of that, um, that, that Lawrenceville neighborhood. I found some of the original sort of uh, PowerPoint documents from when they started the National Robotics Center. Nothing there said anything about community or economic development. It was simply about uh, developing robotics technology and robotics curriculum because at the time in the early 90s, um, colleges didn't really even have curriculum in robotics. And so the goal was to advance robotics technology and to, to develop curriculum. But in the, in, <laughs> along with that came this tremendous sort of economic development. The question, but the question becomes, uh, were the original inhabitants of the Lawrenceville neighborhood shareholders in, in, the, in the prosperity, and there's no real data around that. So the point that you're making about, um, you know, folks who are in, uh, you know, areas or, or professions that we would not consider related to technology, they may be in uh, parts of the country that have not been a part of the Silicon Valley sort of revolution. Uh, but now, uh, with this explosion of technology, we really have the opportunity to be intentional about you know, including um, more folks because we need the numbers, um, and including those folks will lead to the type of stability that supports national security, whether that's economic stability, political stability, social, civil. Um, and, and then there is the sort of the other specter um, that you know, we're in this moment where technology really is going to become a part of professions that haven't been technical before. And that can be intimidating, and we talk all the time about upskilling, um, but there is an opportunity to be intentional in a way that really creates jobs and opportunity versus the specter that we, we always hear about is that AI is going to kill jobs. Well, AI can be a, a force multiplier. It can be an enabler and actually create jobs if we're intentional about it. So I completely agree with my two colleagues, so I'm just going to add something um, very short. So I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic when it comes to the use of artificial intelligence to bridge the digital divide. And part of it comes down to um, what we're talking about from a technology standpoint in the first place. So um, unlike you know past kind of technical innovations, which were primarily grounded in hardware, where you had to go to a factory and it was quite expensive to develop, when we're talking about artificial intelligence, we're fundamentally talking about software. And if we look at machine learning, um, typically when we're talking about machine learning, we're talking about training or inference. So when it comes to training, that is, that is expensive. It's uh, you're relying on mass amounts of compute to train an algorithm, so that's expensive. Once you train that algorithm, you're looking at inference. You're looking at the use of that algorithm um, for various purposes. So we're talking about, say, that farmer. Um, you can use that AI algorithm for inference where you have sensors in the ground, sensors on the crops, to provide data and analysis to that farmer in much more powerful ways to increase crop yields. So once um, an algorithm is de developed, you can theoretically democratize it. You can look at open source applications where you're making things much more accessible to a much larger population in a way that you couldn't do typically with hardware. So I'm decently optimistic that there's things that can be done and we can touch communities that haven't been touched before in these really novel ways. Thank you. So you can ask your question, go ahead. 
Uh, morning. Uh, my name is Jeremy Kurz. I work at AFSOC. Um, I appreciate the discussion today on how policies can sometimes be barriers to innovation. And I want to offer a very specific example that I've dealt with and, and get your, uh, your thoughts on it. So this policy is the DOD's implementation of Section 848 of the uh, 2020 NDAA. And for those not familiar, that law basically says that the DOD can't use any UAS that contain uh, Chinese or Russian critical components, um, which on its surface sounds like a fine law uh, until you realize that you go into any SCIF in America and our computers are full of GPUs made by NVIDIA uh, in China. So the law seems kind of silly when you think of it in that context. Uh, but the DOD's implementation went way beyond just the law, and it, it basically put a blanket ban on units using any kind of UAS that are not on the approved uh, blue UAS list. And even if you want to take those UAS and modify them in any way, you have to go through a lengthy review process. Um, and I've gone through that process. I've gotten additional UAS, uh, co commercial UAS approved. Um, I do not wish that process on my worst enemy, maybe China, but that is a terrible process and it's not worth the time. Um, so I just want to offer that up and, and ask, should Congress consider repealing a law like that? Or should they consider, when they do make a law like that, putting uh, constraints on how the DOD implements that law so they don't go beyond the scope and then hamper our ability to innovate? Thank you. I, like you, have lived that process. And the unfortunate thing is I'm being filmed, so I'm going to be really careful about how I talk about that process. <laughs> Um, you know, because at the, at the time, I was the director of vehicle technology directorate in Army Research Laboratory, and we had researchers that were doing all sorts of great work with all sorts of people using all sorts of, you know, flying platforms. Um, I think in the, the intro, um, Armand mentioned that within Army Research Laboratory, I stood up a robotics research campus, which when I started, it was a 14-acre site and then it became a 200-acre site. Now it's a 700-acre site with um, all sorts of, of wooded forest, trails, there's shoreline, and we own the airspace above it. Um, and the reason that we set that site up was because it gives us an opportunity to really collect unique data sets that will be curated. And of course, you know, data is the new oil, data is gold. So we, we really put ourselves in a position where uh, it, it, you know, we were an agency or, or a, not an agency, a, a, a laboratory that worked with partners who really we would fund them to do work with us. But once we had this site and we were creating this curated data, um, I had professors tell me I'll work for free for data, right? And so it put us in this really um, interesting position, but then came this, um, you know, regulation. And th there was a waiver process for us where we had to go to very high levels uh, in, uh, in, in Army you know, headquarters to get this approval. Um, it was very restrictive. And this is the reason why living through that is the reason why I listen to the discussions now and, and with great trepidation, I guess is the word, um, because everyone is saying, do something, do something, do something. And we've seen what the something has looked like before, right? And to your point, it puts us in a position where, you know, you wouldn't wish it on the worst enemy, but I, you know, I, I mentioned Alex Cott before, the former uh, chief scientist of Army Research Laboratory. I'll never forget, we were in an executive level meeting in a conference room, you know, beautiful view high up, and, and we were bickering about something. And when it came his time to talk, he said, I wonder, if science leaders in China are sitting in a conference room arguing over issues as mundane as this. And it really brought sort of a very serious uh, sort of, uh, you know, tone to the conversation. And that's really, I think, what we have to start to think about when we want to do the right thing. I'm not saying that Congress is not trying to do the right thing or that anyone who is a regulator is not trying to do the right thing. but. It, it, it's not that there's a war coming. We are in competition. It has begun. And our competitor is extraordinarily capable. Um, any statistic you look at, you will come away, I think, with the conclusion that we're being outpaced. And I don't care what statistic you pick. And so when we start to think about how we're regulating um, these tools that will become 
you know, our advantage in maintaining technological dominance. I, I'm very worried, right? And I want um, folks who have that responsibility, who are trying to do the right thing, to really, I, you know, the best thing I can say to them is, you know, again, this old analogy, you know, measure twice, cut once, right? Before you go, be sure. And um, the, the concerning thing is that they are, they do have their own experts that they're listening to. People are always constantly coming in. Um, but, but I am, you know, encouraged by the fact that there, there's a lot of testimony going, along, going on now. Uh, folks are taking in a lot of information. Um, we, we have now folks saying, you know, we're, some plans are developing. But I think we've shown in some cases, I will give uh, DOD credit because the way that the implementation was done, we did have to get the waivers and it was really difficult. But you know the Blue UAS program in, in DIU, I, I consider a success because out of that program, you do have now um, one of those small UAV companies that is now moving to actually um, being a, a procurement program in the Army um, with Skydio providing um, the, the short range recognizance small UAS. So there is success there, um, but I share your concern um, and I hope that in this sort of uh, rush to do something, um, that we can really focus on doing the right thing, but you know it remains to be seen. Sometimes uh, legislatures and legislators are not very nuanced. So, very much agree with what we just heard there. Um, I'm I'm constantly given legislation, uh, you know, to try to cut on and capture and ca catch some of these kind of things. Because I, I believe Congress has realized they've overstepped, but you know when they first look at this kind of stuff, they go, "Oh, great, you know, work development. Now we have to build this this capability uh, for uh, UAS and these new technologies in the United States." So some positive reasoning went behind it, but it went too far. You know, your house is on fire. There's a large fire in downtown New York City in a high rise and uh, uh, New York uh, Fire Department uses the drones to, to the command center where the chief is to look at the heat and do we care if that's a DJI drone in that moment? Maybe if it's a nuclear plant with a turbine overheat that's going and we have the drone flying around or it's a military application, do we care there? Probably. So. It's much more nuanced, and we need to start taking, like we do with the, everything else that we do in technologies, is, is develop risk-based risk approaches to look at large categories to, to improve things. First responders are totally different, but in some states, they're requiring, you know, uh, blue, blue list uh, drones. And that, you know, and, and all the drones they've already purchased have to be, you know, thrown out. Just, it, it doesn't pass the logic test. So it, I think it's a risk-based solution. The positive, I think, that's coming out of this is our industry is being forced to catch up. Uh, and that's, that's always a good thing, that uh, we're relying on our uh, natural, national industries to, to take care of this problem. Uh, we're counting on you. Nation security is, is counting on you. Public safety is counting on you. Um, go do this, and if you do it well, you'll make a good profit in the in the process. Steve, do you have any comments on that? Or? Sure. I guess I can just add one short thing um, because I think my co-panelists answered this question well. What worries me about this is that we might be um, regulating things to the point where we're um, inhibiting our warfighters' innovation and kind of adaption space um, in and around technologies. So when we think about a potential future fight in the Indo-Pacific, um, what's going to matter um, is a what typically matters is a correlation of force in a key region. And that correlation of force, because we will be operating in China's near abroad, may not be in our favor. So then you have to ask yourself, what is going to give us that competitive advantage? And it's going to be our creativity, our adaptability, our people, and how we've operationally and organizationally innovated around those technologies. So in the security studies literature, that is what a typical revolution of military affairs is meant to be. It's not a technology on its own, it's a technology with an organizational and operational innovation around it. 
So if we are constraining people from thinking creatively about how they can use UASs today um, for tactical or operational adaption, how they can use AI for new organizational kind of constructs or operational constructs, we are hamstringing ourselves for that future potential fight. Um, so that is just the one thing I would offer. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Heidi Shrek. I'm with oh, is this on? Okay. I'm uh, Heidi Shrek. I'm with Soxan, um, and my question is more geared towards uh, the trust building out with AI in particular. Um, so when I think about it, we go back, and typically advancements in technology also comes with an advancement in the counter to that technology. So missiles get faster and better, and so does the missile defense systems that counter them. Uh, small UAS started becoming very uh, commercially available, and the concerns with, can, like, are they gonna fly over airfields, military bases, my backyard, the counter UAS systems then started to become more of a, not just a more advanced technology, but then more available to the basis of those concerns. When we talk about AI and anything from questions of academic or professional integrity with like ChatGPT that you see in the news a lot right now or any other implications of how that AI can be used, do you feel like there is sufficient development not just on using the capability of AI for you know, new advancements but also the counter to AI and can we turn it off, can we stop it, can we see if this is AI or not? Um, do you feel like that's being appropriately paced with the advancing technology on the user side? It's something in the security studies literature which is called the offense-defense balance. It's that kind of tit for tat from a development standpoint. Um, I think there's two different ways to look at this. So one is, what do we mean when we talk about trust? And pe people typically talk about calibrated trust. So it's calibrating trust in a machine where you recognize that machine's system um, their limit, its limitations. So what is that right amount of trust? And when I've talked about this to people in the past, and you know, forgive me for this like really ridiculous analogy, I oftentimes like to talk about the office. So there's this amazing episode where America's most hapless manager, Michael Scott, he's using a GPS system, and he's driving along, and he's listening to the GPS, and it's telling Michael S Scott to turn right. And Dwight Schrute's like yelling at Michael Scott saying, do not turn right, you are gonna turn right into a pond. And Michael Scott's saying, hey, no, it's telling me to turn right, so I'm gonna turn right. And lo and behold, he ends up in a pond. Now this sounds like a really ridiculous story, but the problem is in the past, we have trusted technology too much. So for instance, in 2003 with our Patriot missile system, um, one of the operators trusted the system too much. It didn't question, he didn't, he or she did not question the system information, and it ended up resulting in fratricide in Iraq. So you have to understand that system's limitations, which is why trust calibration is so important, and why it's so important for people to have extensive experience operating with that technology, which gets to, I think, your, the second point of your question, which kind of comes down to, all right, well, what is that tit for tat look like and what are those kind of counter UAS kind of capabilities and I know Lux is gonna have a lot to say about this. And we've been talking a lot on this panel about the positive elements of these kind of uncrewed systems. What we do have to realize is that um, AI as it remains right now, narrow AI, is incredibly brittle. So for instance, if I have a training data set where I'm training a um, uncrewed system in you know the deserts of California and then I use it in a urban environment in you know the winter in Massachusetts the performance of that uncrewed system is going to significantly go down or it could fail and then we think about warfare well warfare is replete with the unexpected it's full of fog and friction so you know our ability to understand what that might do it could still fail in kind of unexpected ways so we have to be very smart about you know testing these cases capabilities to its limits, putting um, a human alongside that uncrewed system in multiple different scenarios so that human isn't expecting that machine to be perfect because it never will be. We should also remember humans are never perfect, but that you understand that system's limitations so that also it's predictable so that if that machine is sabotaged or subverted by an adversary, you also understand that it's not operating the way you expect as well. So I'll just offer that before. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, do you want to? Yeah. 
Real quick, because we, we had much discussion over this topic uh, the other day, and the, what I liken it to in my, my experience is um, you think of flying, uh, a formation of flight, and we know who's good at what uh, because we experience together. We fly in all kinds of different environments. What Jen and I got into a discussion about, what's lacking in my parlance right now is the debrief. We don't have the ability that I know of at an operational level, an understanding level of, let's say, a pilot. We're, gonna, we're doing drones. I have my trusted wingman flying with me, and the trusted wingman can probably give me more feedback on areas with sensors on me, you know, Jen, Jen educated me on this, that could tell me that I was inefficient, you know, I'm stressed out here in this decision, you know, why did you make this decision versus another decision? AI is good at that, but I can't get, and if I'm the flight lead, I need to understand my trusted wingman on what are they doing? Why did you do that? Why did you perform? Why did, you know, or just different phases of flight when things went well, you know, that feedback loop to really understand each other so that when you're actually operating as a team or you're a commander that has, to, has AI as part of its team, the commander understands the strengths and weaknesses and can determine the risk that he or she is willing to take going forward using AI. That, I think, that feedback loop somehow, I'm not smart enough to figure it out, but I, that's what I see lacking uh, as, as an operator. Yeah, and I would um, add, it's very interesting, in your question, you said the term, can we see, right? And this is sort of what Lux is talking about. Um, so um, in, in my, my last DOD job, I was uh, uh, in the Pentagon as the principal director for autonomy. And when I took that job, um, my first meeting with the undersecretary, which was two weeks into the job, um, she said, come up here and tell me what, what you have on trust and trusted autonomy. And um, so I started calling my colleagues uh, who were in the DOD autonomy enterprise and saying, hey, what do we have? Because I had been in the community for a very long time. And from my perspective, we weren't really talking about trust that much as a, as a thing. Um, I knew we had stuff going on in testing, test T, T and V and V as we call it, test evaluation, uh, validation and verification. In other words, we had taken sort of this trust problem and sort of relegated to the test and evaluation community and said, hey, this is a testing thing, right? Um, so, you know, when I went to talk to the undersecretary, that's the way that I talked about the problem. And she said, go figure out where the gaps are and, you know, how do we uh, need, to, need to think about this problem? So I started an initiative in that office, which I called Optima, Operational Trust and Mission Autonomy. And we were really looking at um, when we have uh, human machine teams in complex environments where the risk is, you know, always changing. You know, how can we ensure that the the soldier will trust the machine that the autonomous teammate, right? And you know, as far back as the the summer study that the Defense Science Board did. Uh, on autonomy, which is, you know, the study is from 2015, 2016. There's an entire chapter in that um, study on trust. Um, and, you know, my boss at the time when I was in, in, in the Pentagon, his name is Maynard Holiday. He's still there. He's the assistant secretary for critical technologies. And he said he was in the room when that um, summer study was briefed out to combatant commanders. And the general consensus was this stuff's great, but, you know, I don't trust it, right? A um, few years later, uh, well, in 2020, the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board did a, a study um, on unintended behaviors. And in both the D DSB chapter on trust and then the Air Force later said, we need to have sort of a real-time capability, right? A runtime, some sort of assurance that's runtime, you know, to understand and be able to trust, trust these systems. The latest sort of statement about real-time, runtime, and monitoring, I'll use the word monitoring, um, when the State Department put out their statement on responsible use of autonomy and AI, there's a bulleted list of, of things we need to do to ensure responsible use, and down there in that list is a, a bullet that talks about monitoring, right? What, 
what, what, what, what I did in the Yes is Optima initiative is started to talk to people about, well, why don't we have some way to, you know, to be able to monitor? And people say, well, you can't tell what neural networks are doing. Okay, that's a given. And all the explainability conversations about the fact that we can't understand what neural networks are doing or predict. Or, but these machines are actually operating in an environment and they are creating data. And in fact, when they're with a human, there is, there, there's data being created. So I wanna piggyback on what Jennifer was talking about, about synthetic environments. So if you think about the fact that, um, you know, when we're, when we're talking about an autonomous system, what autonomy is is saying that within some bounds determined by a user, we're gonna allow this machine to make decisions, but within bounds, right? That's, that's the essence or de definition of autonomy that I borrowed, in fact, from Paul Charest's book, Army of None. And so in that sense then, you know, when I hear what, what Jennifer is talking about, it really, um, you know, takes me back to the things that we were doing there because there's something called an assurance case. Um, the Ida did a great report on insurance cases. And the reason I'm throwing out these names is so that you can go find these reports, by the way, um, in, in which they talk about sort of creating these structured uh, sort of questions and within those saying, well, what, what can the system do and if we can say that it's okay to operate within this structured environment, then, then we, we, we can be, you know, we can trust the system. Well, so think about then what Jennifer is talking about. She's saying that in a synthetic environment, we can run through millions of scenarios and sort of measure the human and the machine together to develop what I call quantifiable metrics, right? And so now if we know in the scenario, and this was what Optimal was all about, if we know in the scenario what our operational objective is. We can define what is mission success and run the scenario and sort of look at the human machine interaction in the scenario and develop some, some sort of parameters, some metrics. And those metrics then, they don't become the trust, but they're proxies for trust. They're the state, the conditions that we need for trust. And I think Jennifer has talked about, you know, taking physical measurements and using those physical measurements, you know, in real time. And so what we talked about in Optima was if we can do that in these assurance cases, if we can know what these quantifiable metrics are, then those are the things we measure as proxies for trust. And so you can imagine then in a scenario, if those things become out of balance, we don't have the condition of trust we need for operational success. And so we talked about this as sort of quantifiable metrics associated with operational effectiveness. And once you start to talk that language, you can now talk to an acquisition person and say you now have some uh, objectives for operational effectiveness, you have some KPPs, KSAs, all those things, and you have objectives and thresholds, and our metrics now can be spoken in that language to a sort of an acquisition program. So now we can talk to folks who are gonna buy autonomous systems about their operational objectives and you know, devolve that into quantifiable metrics for trust. So we can now build in trust into how you're acquiring autonomous systems. This is the goal of the Optima program. Now, this program now exists within Test Resource Management Center, Center and they're actually running pilots. I really wanna introduce Jennifer to those folks because the pilots that they're trying to run is, in a, a, is they're taking things into live constructive um, ex experiment uh, environments to start to develop, you know, what do some of these metrics look like? And now once you have those metrics, can you talk about those in terms of operational effectiveness? Can you now translate those into the language that an acquisition manager would be able to use to now say, as I buy my autonomous system, I have a way to say that I'm buying trust with it. Trust is now a commodity that I'm buying. And that's the way we started to sort of think about the problem. Um, and, you know, the program transitioned over and there, there, there's some pilots being run now. But, um, you know, I think that some of the pushback that I received was people said, oh, well, you know, as, you know, younger folks come in, they'll trust technology more, so we don't have to worry about that. They'll, they'll just trust it more. Other people said, you know, we'll just train on it enough until you have trust. But what we've seen um, in Ukraine is that new technologies are being introduced in high-risk environments where we're at now the pace of the fight, and is there, is there time for training when new technologies are coming? So to your point, can we see, can we put in monitoring around metrics that can allow us to understand the sort of state of the conditions that we need for trust and, um, and connect that to operational effectiveness? So my, my vote is for having these quantifiable metrics. My vote is for doing more of the work 
uh, that Jennifer is doing so that those metrics then can be built into how we design the system, deploy the system, use the system going forward. Jarrett and Jen, you guys are killing me because here we go again, technology outpacing regulatory framework. So I'm going to need your help uh, in this the safest national airspace system in the world. How do I build a uh, regulatory framework and, and language around that? That's the challenge. Sounds like a good one, yeah. right? And a marketable one. <laughs> um, sounds great. So I just want to add two comments, one of them to answer your question from my own point of view, uh, made in China. So I, we worked, I was a lead engineer in a company like almost 10 years ago. And we wanted to make a product from zero to 100 and we wanted to call it made in USA. Like we did everything that we wanted and we did a lot. It took two years for us to make that product, and it took a long time. We were like several engineers working all together. We even made the processors by ourselves. At the end of the day, when we finished that, we wanted to sell it, obviously, right? But the product that we made, it was a machine-to-machine -machine product. It was three times higher than the same one that was made in China. So I'm just putting it there because uh, I don't want to say that regulation is not okay or is, it should be changed. I just want to say that probably we need to go back a bit more mm. and come up with layers in order to provide all the necessary uh, items or components that we need in order to make everything made in USA. So that's, that's about you. So the comment for you is, uh, we, the way that we are doing the testing and verification of uh, uh, like unmanned aerial vehicles or autonomous vehicles in general, we have, like we say that AIs is used in unmanned aerial vehicles or any autonomous systems. So we have an AI that is going to generate scenarios and it's going to generate edge cases. We have another AI that we implemented and it's going to generate cyber attacks and cyber attack or any adversarial issues. We put the human at the, be at the middle in order to experience all these uh, distractions or all these scenarios to let the uh, human uh, to let the human know that there is not much of trust so you need to be aware of all these different situations and you have to contract and we can use that in order to make sure our system or our AI is doing well and is trustworthy is safe robust and resilient so any other questions from the audiences Yes. That's great. Yeah, I got another one. Sorry. Um, so I spent the better part of the last two years leading a small team that did rapid uh, uh, innovation and rapid prototyping of small UAS and mission-specific payloads. Um, and by virtue of that position, I had a lot of access to different departments, uh, offices within the DoD, and across the interagency, and. Inevitably, every couple of weeks, I was surprised by finding another team that was working on something very similar to mine, often completely the same thing, and we had no idea, our higher-ups had no idea that there was so much stovepiping going on. Uh, hopefully, this isn't a surprise to a lot of people that work in government. Um, so my question, specifically as it relates to the Replicator Initiative, um, what steps do you think the government needs to take to cut down on those stovepipes? and actually synchronize the efforts and all the brain power that we have throughout the government to streamline how we do this uh, development. So. All right, now I'm very replicator. Um, <laughs> so it's really interesting because, you know, if you look at the, the speeches that the Deputy Secretary made, in, in, in both of those, you know, I, I'm obviously uh, biased and a huge fan, but um, in both of those speeches, she, she, she makes some points about what Replicator is. Thousands of drones, multiple domains, 18 to 24 months. But there's also the notion that this will become a way of understanding how to move quickly to adopt technology. And then the Replicator is not just replicating drones, but actually replicating processes. And so what we learn in this effort will then translate to others. 
Um, and so the way that is is being set up is that uh, there is a, a a a new board that that she and the vice chief chair, um, but a part of that board there is a working group uh, that the DIU will chair. So the new DIU director is now charged with moving forward to actually operationalize or execute um, for Replicator. And so the hope that I have is that that part will actually take hold. Right? We actually see uh, new things being done, uh, things being uh, tried and experimented with, and, and have, having to understand a process that then can be translated uh, to other technologies and to other things that, that, that we're doing going forward. Um, I think that, uh, you know, with, with, with that in mind, uh, there are some, you know, the, the new DIU director has been talking about, you know, DIU in a new way. So this was DIU 3.0 according to the new director, where 1.0 was sort of developing those relationships, uh, 2.0 was gaining some new authorities and, and sort of putting out BAAs and learning how to do, and now 3.0 is how do you do it at scale? Um, and so, you know, not to promote my blog piece, but in, in the, my recent blog post, I sort of refer to the fact that, you know, wildly successful replicator will get us two years out. Where do we go from there going forward? And there's a potential role for CDAO to play with support from Congress because it's right there in the, uh, well, there's language in the appropriations bill. I don't know if it will become, become law, but um, with support from Congress to say, CDAO, go out and set up a autonomy enterprise platform and, and here are the resources to do that. That notion around autonomy enterprise platform could be a role for CDAO to play in coordinating in the style of replicator, but going forward. But what that calls for it really is a, what I refer to as a stakeholder evolution. So to get to this point, the, the key stakeholders the, the, uh, are from the leadership of the in, uh, innovation ecosystem. But now going forward, if we are wildly successful and deploy thousands of these um, or field or purchase thousands of these, it's now really on the, the, on the acquisition leadership and our operational community leadership. And so after Replicator, CDAO could play a role of coordinating between acquisition uh, stakeholders and, and operational stakeholders in the leadership to, to take us forward. But this notion of, of how do we do it, I think what Replicator is, is designed to do is to say, you know, here's, here's a process, we're doing it quickly, now can we translate that process to other places? So autonomy is the place where they will start, but the notion is two years from now, you, you pivot to something else, taking your processes, using them, refining, getting better at this. And so uh, that part of the replicator program is just as important as the things that will be bought, you know, replicator in sort of designing new processes as well. Um, I guess I'll just build on that very briefly. So the, one of the good things about the way replicators uh, set up and how it's set up with now the defense innovation unit is the head of DIU is now a direct report into the Secretary of Defense, which is a new change as well. So when we look at you know drivers of innovation, um, the role of champions is one thing people look at. And if you've got you know the Secretary of Defense watching this very closely as a direct report, that should help to that should at least help replicator succeed in ways that maybe other things may not. I'm torn, to be honest. I know like one of the things we like to point at is there's always multiple things going on within the bowels of the Pentagon where they're operating in silos and seemingly everyone's doing very, there's different groups doing very similar things. Um, I can understand problems with that, particularly from like a taxpayer perspective and obviously like, you know, good ideas come from different communities working together. Um, at the same time, you know, there have been, there are good instances in the past where inner service rivalry or intra service rivalry have been drivers of innovation where you've seen different things ongoing that are very similar at the same time. And one seems to kind of pull out above the others. And then that technology or that process is the one that you choose to pull forward and replicate. So I guess I, part of me kind of cautions against the idea of this one place where this would take place because what if that was not the right technology or process? So sometimes I do think it's beneficial to have kind of these multiple different organizations working in tandem on you know, the same problem um, because out of that diversity, you should have a, a good idea or a good capability. Great point. 
you. Do you have Hold any additional comments? I think they did a great job. I so. That's great. Um, I think we will um, almost get to the point of closing mark remarks. Um, I would like each of the panelists to talk about their closing remarks, and I want them to also think about uh, one topic or one thing that the audiences, when they go back next week to their offices, they can do to ease this process. Can I give them maybe I'm five seconds I'm, to I'm think? I'm happy to, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna do closing remarks on what I, what I wanna talk about, to be honest. <laughs> so, so yesterday, um, one of the students from USF asked this question on the cyber side, and it was a very good question, and so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about um, cyber and unmanned systems. So when we think about the future operating environment, we all realize that we're gonna be operating in this denied and degraded environment that's going to ha be replete with adversary cyber, electronic, or information-based effects. So any system that we will be deploying will be um, subject to adversary um, sabotage, espionage, or subversion. Like that is just going to be the kind of state of operation. So there's a few different ways to kind of look at how do you operate in this future environment um, with uncrewed systems or autonomous systems. So one is to look at the cybersecurity side, the information assurance piece, which is why I thought this student asked a very good question. Now, and I know, um, Aman, you do a lot of work on this as well. So no system, despite what industry may tell you at times, will ever be entirely cyber secure. Each new update, each change, um, you know, each new interconnection will breed vulnerabilities in some way, shape, or form. So we are always going to need to focus on the information assurance piece of the systems that we're fielding, but we ne do need to be aware of that. And then when we think about autonomous systems, this adds greater complexity to it. So within the cyber literature, there's this concept of the cyber capability vulnerable vulnerability paradox. So the more capable a system, the more exquisite a system, the more vulnerable it will become. And so we have to be aware of that when we field systems. So if no system will ever be entirely cyber secure, and we will focus on the information assurance piece because we have to, what is the way that we're going to maintain mission assurance despite operating in a denied and degraded environment with these exquisite systems? Because we will operate that way. I, I offer that we need to be thinking about the mission assurance piece. This is part of the reason why I work in my field, so, you know, sorry to like hype my own work, but this, this is another reason why I think, you know, the use of synthetic environments are so important. So when we think about the future of human-machine teaming, or we think about, you know, um, what gives us an edge in future conf conflict, I fundamentally believe it's based on our human operators, their ability to be critical thinkers, their ability to be agile. So how do we put them in situations where they are constantly being exposed to these denied and degraded environments where the information on their platforms is being sabotaged or subverted or denied or degraded so that they think critically? So that they start to think about how do I operate, say, when my GPS is out? How do I operate when, for some reason, the system's information doesn't seem to correlate with what I heard or what I'm seeing from other, say, data feeds? Like we need to instill that creativity in our warfighters because our systems will be sabotaged, denied, or degraded. So that, I guess, is the last thing. That's kind of what I want to um, leave people with is what does that paradigm shift look like as we move from a paradigm of information assurance to one of mission assurance? Sounds great, thanks. Really great. Um, so it's been an honor to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I think, you know, I want to go back to this issue of balance. You know, I want to hit on one thing, though, in, um, in the, the replicator discussion uh, on the issue of attritability. And I think that, you know, we talk about, you know, thousands of drones and, and, and purchasing drones, but I think one of the biggest things here is this notion of attritability, right? This uh, uh, attritable, um, affordable autonomous systems. And, you, you know, when we hear this attributability, I think we need to sort of make a distinction that it's not just expendable or expendability, right? Because I think people hear attributable and they think kamikaze drone. 
Uh, but when the Deputy Secretary spoke recently, she said, we're talking about systems that, rather than systems we use 30 to 50 years, systems we use three to five years, right? So that means it's reusable. It's not a kamikaze, it's a three to five year system. But that has tremendous sorts of uh, consequences for cost and all sorts of things. Because when we're designing systems that we, you know, we intend for longer term use, there's all sorts of costs built into that. And so having a system that's a three to five year use that you're gonna move on from uh, really bends the cost curve significantly, but it also uh, is a completely different paradigm. Uh, than what we have typically operated or how we've typically operated. So this notion of attributability is one to not miss. There's another aspect of attributability to take into account in terms of what it gives us uh, in terms of, of engaging um, adversary, right? Because having a massive set of systems um, that create uh, the dilemma for the adversary uh, sort of says to an adversary, I can take out part of that mass, but the rest of the systems there can complete the mission. And so this creates a sort of deterrent um, that, that you would not have uh, otherwise, because then the, the, the adversary has to think about how to counter that system, or that, that group of ma massive group of systems, um, because you can't take them all out and just taking out a small bit um, doesn't necessarily give you advantage. So that's another aspect of this um, attributability that creates advantage. And so as we think about what replicator is, it's thousands of, but there are thousands of attributable systems. And think about what that means in terms of operation, the consequences for that. Really, uh, you know, it's not just a, a sort of thought exercise, but really a place to think about where there are significant opportunities. And I just want to end on that balance issue again about how we're creating policy. I think we saw another great example yesterday uh, from the keynote speaker, um, uh, General Dunlap, who was talking about this policy that's been created around UAVs and how it's, you know, is creating handcuffs. I was, you know, not aware of this, and I, I you know, continually had to pick my jaw up off of the floor um, when he was making, uh, giving his remarks, um, because I think we've seen enough uh, of the, the, the fact that, you know, we can cripple ourselves uh, in these technology discussions based on you know, how we advance policy. And the other specter of that is that we really are facing uh, a potential uh, technological overmatch tipping point where we have that overmatch now, but it could go in the other direction. And when it goes in the other direction, I fear it will go exponentially in the other direction. It won't be something that we can uh, quickly regain. And so as we think then about how we're doing policy, those things about competition have to have to be uh, f uh, f at the forefront. And I say that from a defense perspective, but there's also a domestic element of that. Uh, the job creation, the stability in economics and, and uh, um, other, other um, uh, areas that can be created from these technologies really uh, equates back to national security. And so this balance around how we're thinking about policy is extraordinarily important in this moment as we're thinking about what we might do and there's an urge or, or, or push to do something. And so as you go back, I think, you know, if you take that with you, that would be something that I think will serve us uh, greatly in the conversation um, that is still developing and we really uh, don't know exactly where it's going, but I, you know, um, I think it's to our benefit to end up in a good place on this. And so the balance thing is something I wanna emphasize. Thank you. As, as the last panel and the last uh, panelist to make a comment, I, I, I see kind of a couple things that I need to do. A thank you, uh, um, some positive words, and then I guess an ask. On the positive note, I've been humbled to sit with my fellow panelists and listen to the speakers over the uh, you know, last two days, and it's been absolutely incredible. Uh, thanks for that opportunity, and I think this should continue uh, to continue to work towards solutions in, in the future. It's, it's, been, it's been very enlightening. On the uh, positive side, you know, it's that balance we need to move forward. The, it's not just the risk, it's, it's the rewards. To the students in the room, you know, the world is your oyster. This technology is so new, so nascent. You can take this any direction you want to go. This, this, so do it. 
and like Jen pointed out earlier, it's not just the technology. It's, it's the um, structure of the organization. It's doctrine. It's um, training. It's all of that that has to support this thing to really move it forward. So the opportunity, so and the innovators in the room to keep that in mind. And then to our commanders, um, same thing, trust. You know, make sure you understand the trust in the system. But then, you know, trust in the youth with some incredible ideas. When I was that uh, commander of that first armed UAV squadron, and they could told me, oh, we can fly these things uh, from anywhere in the world, and you don't have to be in the footprint. I, I was like, you're lying to me. Yeah. But that, that's just a little simple step, and they've done so many more things. It's just incredible to let them run, give them, give them the long leash, and then when they're wrong, that's a learning opportunity, not a, not a uh, slap you down. It's okay, so what are you gonna do about it? And let's move that stuff forward. Um, my ask is um, as we try to operate, and then for, for military in the room, <clears throat> your training environments, if you wanna be stuck in a restricted area and not be able to move these assets around and also take advantage of all the civil opportunities these things provide you uh, and our, us as a society, I need, I need help. When you run into roadblocks that are regulatory or standards in, na in nature, I need to hear about them so I can get the funding to go tackle the issue if it's uh, one of the priority issues. But if I don't know, I can't go work those problems on the regulatory front with our uh, FAA, and then increasingly we're supporting regulators around the globe. So uh, that that's how I will close. So I'm always open uh, to hear of your issues, your breakthroughs, and happy to work your problems. Thank you all. So um, I like the fact that uh, two of my panelists, they mentioned cybersecurity as well. We have a breakout session in the afternoon about cybersecurity and security challenges of uh, autonomous systems, so I hope you can join. With that, I'll close the panel, and I would like you help me to give a round of applause for my panelists. Well, also, thank you very much to you, Armand, for moderating this great panel. And let me quote Dr. Reddick. It is not that a war is coming. We are in competition now. Now, the question is, have we really accepted this competition? I will not go too much before lunch, but at some points we argue that we really, really need a strategy for this strategic competition, a whole of government strategy at all levels if we're in this. Well, we're now ready to break until lunch, but please join me back at exactly 1.30 because you do not want to miss our keynote afternoon speaker, Lieutenant General Grinkovich, Commander of Absent and Combined Air Force Component Commander for the United States Central Command. So enjoy your lunch and we'll see you back sharp at 1.30. Well, good afternoon and welcome back to the Great Power Competition Conference by GNSI. I'm hoping everyone had a wonderful lunch and there were some great conversations. Well, we are incredibly honored now to introduce you this afternoon's keynote speaker, Lieutenant General Alexis Grinkovich. Lieutenant General Grinkovich is the commander of the 9th Air Force Air Center at Shaw Air Force Base, South Carolina, and the Combined Force Air Component Commander for the United States Central Command. In these roles, the general is responsible for developing contingency plans and conducting air operations in 21 nation area of responsibility covering Central and Southwest Asia. Lieutenant General Grinkovich received his commission in 1993 after graduating from the U.S. Air Force Academy. He has served as an instructor pilot, weapons officer, and operational test pilot in the F-16 Falcon, uh, Fighting Falcon and F-22 Rapture. He has commanded at the squadron, wing, air expeditionary task for levels. 
His staff assignments include service at Air Co uh, Combat Command at U.S. European Command, U.S. Central Command, Headquarter Air Force, and the Joint Staff. And I would also like to offer a heartfelt thank you to Lieutenant General Krinkovich, who has been with us with great power competition from day one, and we had a brief conversation over lunch that he was the one actually in his capacity at J3 that approved our project for these uh, conferences. And I'm not sure, General, you kind of, this is the fruit of what we started some years ago, and, and maybe you like to tell your side of the story on how this collaboration started. And I think this is a successful collaboration between two large institutions that usually don't collaborate. This is the academia and the military. So the platform that we have developed is a key to success to this. And also right now with GNSI and General McKenzie, we are ready to take it to the next step. So General Grinkovich, please uh, welcome me. I mean, let's welcome General Grinkovich to speak. If I'd known I was going to have to come back and speak, I'm not sure I would have approved the conference. Uh, but no, it truly has been a great collaboration between U.S. Central Command uh, and, uh, and USF over the years. Uh, and having seen this conference through several iterations, including through COVID, as we were discussing over lunch, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's always a pleasure to participate. It's always a pleasure uh, to see uh, where, uh, where this can go moving forward. So a good afternoon, and I guess first I do want to say thank you for the invitation to come speak. Uh, the team here at uh, the Global and National Studies Institute at USF, it's been a, you know, the, the little bit of the conference I got to participate in, the panel before lunch, really impressive uh, set of speakers, and I'm sure that that's repeated over and over uh, again. It was also very nice to uh, get to meet some new friends and spend a little time uh, with my previous boss, General McKenzie, at dinner last night. A anyone who knows General McKenzie will, knows that he is an ardent student of military history. And so I, I won't give you the full context of the discussion we had at dinner yesterday evening, but he was talking about failed military campaigns and that really a lot more generals need to be fired, which I, I thought was pretty convenient position to have as a retired general. Um, <laughs> But uh, it also puts a little bit more pressure on me because he'll, he'll tell you retired generals, no one cares what they think, but uh, retired generals do have a lot of influence on what happens to those of us who are still not quite yet retired and what our future looks like. Uh, so a little bit more pressure. And if I stumble once or twice, it's because I'm feeling the heat uh, from General McKenzie uh, sitting there over on the side. But sir, thank you. Great to see you again. What I'd like to do today is offer an airman's perspective and really a practitioner's perspective to you on why autonomy is critical uh, to achieving the effects that we want to achieve uh, at Air Forces Central. I'll talk a little bit about how I see that playing out in future conflicts, and I'll also talk about what we're doing today uh, to prepare for those future conflicts, because the future, guess what? It could be 10 years from now, or it could be tomorrow. Uh, and that's especially true in the Middle East, a region that's uh, not necessarily known for its stability. At the end of this, I'll conclude with some thoughts on difficult issues that we'll have to face in the ethical realm that I think we do need to navigate through and that we need to think through ahead of time so that they don't catch us unawares uh, at endgame. So I know you heard from uh, Lieutenant General Guillo, uh, the Deputy Commander at U.S. Central Command earlier in this conference, and he talked a little bit about a guy named Colonel John Boyd in a decision-making model called the OODA loop. Many of you have probably heard of this, but it stands for Observe, Orient, uh, Decide, and Act. And John Boyd was an airman. Uh, he came up with this, uh, this four-step process for decision-making, if you will, uh, as he was exploring how to more quickly and more rapidly make decisions in the realm of fighter tactics and really in the realm of dogfighting. Um, but what he came up with was later adapted by none less than the United States Marine Corps as they looked to transform how they made decisions, not at the tactical level, but at the operational level of warfare, and how quickly could they go through an OODA loop as they thought about co combined arms warfare, uh, fire and maneuver, uh, et cetera. So the, the theories that he came up with went much further than just dogfighting, if you will. 
And in that vein, the model is meant to explain how to increase the tempo of decisions so that you can outpace, outmaneuver, and ultimately, of course, defeat an adversary. The objective of thinking through what your decision process is, of thinking through this OODA loop, is to figure out how you can make your decisions faster than your opponent can, compelling them to react to your actions and enabling you to seize the initiative. In short, Boyd, arg Boyd argued that speed and decision-making and the pace of your actions could yield a decisive advantage. But what if an adversary that you're facing is not a human? What if it's a machine that's making those decisions? And what if that machine is able to make them orders of magnitude faster than you can, almost instantaneously? Assuming that it makes the appropriate decision at approximately or roughly the same rate uh, as a human, it's likely that the only thing that would be able to get inside that AI-driven OODA loop would be another AI-enabled or automated system going through its own OODA loop. What I would argue is our adversaries understand this, and because of that, they are pursuing this kind of technology with urgency and with ample funding, as we heard about a little bit uh, previous uh, to lunch. And my assertion would be that we cannot afford to stand by and let them bypass us uh, or outflank us uh, in this area. There have been some who've made calls to ban uncrewed or autonomous warfare because of some of the risks that we see inherent in it. Uh, but these technologies are coming to a battlefield near you whether we want them to or not. And I'd argue in many ways they've been present on that battlefield for a long time already. There is more continuity in the history of warfare than discontinuity in my mind. We've been developing autonomy in airmen's terms for over 100 years. Started with a Gatling gun as we mounted that on our aircraft, where the gun automatically or autonomously loaded the next bullet so that the human didn't have to. As the fighter community moved from guns to missiles as a primary air-to-air -air weapon, what we really did was assign part of the mission chain, the targeting and killing in this case, to an autonomous kamikaze wingman, and that would be the missile that we're shooting. That missile is uh, early on was short range, but today your medium and long range missiles can fly autonomously well beyond visual range, making decisions about when to engage, how to fly at the end game, how to intercept, uh, et cetera. So moving the point of autonomy from an airman's perspective to other concepts such as an arsenal plane, a longer range air to air weapon or an air to ground weapon, or even an unmanned collaborative combat aircraft merely extends the logic that fighter aviation has used since the advent of the missile age. What we face today is autonomy and the kill chain moved even further back. We now see the responsibilities previously reserved only for humans, such as who to target and who to kill, potentially being given to a machine. I'd argue your US Air Force is in a good position, maybe even a unique position, to capitalize on these kinds of technologies. The ranges that new weapons possess uh, and the range from which they can extend their lethality uh, naturally leads to a focus on uncrewed platforms to provide more range, uh, not just to our own weapons, but as a way to decrease the risk to human life. The speed of warfare at the tactical and the operational level has increased as those ranges have increased all the way back to World War II. And this was really part of what Boyd thought about and what was a stimulus for his thinking through the OODA loop. The initial theories of fighter combat, again, had much broader applications. So he thought of these 50 years ago, the Marine Corps adopted them about 40 years ago, and today we see the trend continues, uh, potentially even outpacing human capability. One problem that we may face as we adapt these new technologies uh, and as our adversaries adapt these new technologies they may not share the same ethical values that we do when they're integrating artificial intelligence onto their weapon uh, or their weapons. We, in my view, must resist the urge to engage in a race to the bottom and employ our own moral restraint, and we've got to keep that as the bedrock upon which we build the foundation of our doctrine and approaches uh, to using these weapons. But before I get into that, I'd like to share my view as to why autonomous systems are worth pursuing, what advantages they bring to the battlefield, and why, despite this moral hazard, we need to think about how to take advantage of them. 
AFCENT, as I mentioned, is already taking advantage of several of these opportunities, and I'll talk through that here in a, the coming minutes uh, as well. So let's start with why this conversation is worth having at all. To do this, I'll lean on some work I did about five to seven years ago looking at air superiority in the 2030 timeframe and what capabilities the U.S. Air Force would need to develop to be successful in gaining the degree of control in the air that we would need to generate effects from the air domain. The quality and duration of the time that we control the air in the future, I would argue, is going to be different than what we've experienced in the past 20 or 30 years. In future large-scale conflicts, air, super air superiority is likely to be a temporal condition over just a discrete piece of geography, a discrete space, that will enable other effects either by the Air Force or other services in the Joint Force. Achieving air superiority in the future will require, in my view, an integrated and networked family of capabilities comprised of both standoff and stand-in assets. Stand-in assets, in layman's parlance, are those that seek to operate inside the range uh, and beside the threat range of enemy defenses, such as penetrating bombers, stealth fighters, and those sorts of things, while standoff assets try to stay outside those defenses, sending longer-range weapons uh, in instead. In either case, the weapon or the thing that is flying into that defended area is gaining air superiority. This is one of the paradoxes of warfare, though. If we just focus on one element of this, if we just focus on building stealthy things that can fly into the mouth of the cat, if you will, or if we just focus on standoff capabilities, or if we just focus on air capabilities at the expense of land, or space capabilities at the expense of air, or cyber capabilities at the expense of everything else, the paradox of warfare is whatever battle you're preparing for, the adversary sees what you're doing to some degree, and prepares for that battle as well. So ultimately, it's critical for us to think about how do we apply autonomy and the capabilities that this is going to bring across a broad swath of, uh, of uh, domains of capabilities that are being developed. Stand-in assets, I would argue, will need to be able to make decisions, whether made by a human or by artificial intelligence, inside enemy airspace with very little to no communication with a commander in the rear. Indeed, to be successful in its mission and not get shot down, a weapon system will have to maintain a degree of air superiority, whether passively through evasion, stealth, jamming, uh, or actively by using kinetic weapons in self-defense. Whether assisting a human or through complete autonomy on its own, maintaining air superiority in contested environments will require speed of decision-making that's only going to be possible through automation. A good example of this is the transition that you heard about in my uh, introduction uh, of going from the F-16 to the F-22. The decisions I was making in the F-16 were much slower because I was having to manage sensors. I was manually fusing the information that came in from those sensors in the gray matter in my brain. In the F-22, the sensors were automatically managed, and the fusion of the information was done by the onboard fire control computer so that now I could return to tactical decision making as opposed to being a sensor manager. Similarly, uncrewed and autonomous standoff weapons, uh, ideally at lower cost, provide an appealing option for achieving mass at a distance. Integrating autonomy across the spectrum of our capabilities is different and, in my view, a more balanced approach than we've taken in the past. In terms of air platforms, the types of resiliency of networks we use will vary significantly and does vary significantly between manned, remotely crewed, or entirely autonomous systems. Remotely manned systems present to me the biggest challenges when it comes to the network that enables them. They require high bandwidth of secure and reliable global communications, and this is likely untenable when you're fighting in highly congested space. Even an agile, smart, and self-healing network can't maintain access to that bandwidth in the face of raw jamming power projected over short distances. This means that in order to penetrate an integrated defensive system, our platforms must be increasingly autonomous and able to make decisions within that airspace, again, without guidance from afar. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but I would argue that our current semi-autonomous and manned platforms are actually similar in their bandwidth requirements. This makes sense if you consider that a manned platform is actually partly autonomous, at least from the network's perspective. 
The commander orders it to do its mission, but once ordered, the autonomous brains of the platform, whether they're artificial or human, execute the mission on their own without the need for an elaborate or robust communications network back to a ground station. Of course, there's a fiscal and human cost to supporting crewed systems. Currently, even unmanned systems like the MQ-9 are crewed throughout their entire mission, requiring dozens of personnel over a 24-hour period to keep them airborne. Uncrewed systems, on the other hand, are no longer limited by humans that need things like sleep, food, or bathroom breaks. Endurance is not the only benefit in a world that's saturated with data. An autonomous system should be able to ingest and process all the data available to it and make better decisions about whether and how to employ force. Uncrewed and fully autonomous systems also provide unprecedented opportunities to scale up and mass effects without putting humans at risk. This is exactly what DepSecDef Hicks recently announced in her replicator initiative, in my view. Drawing on commercially available capabilities to accelerate the scaling of some type of all-domain, uh, attritable autonomous systems. War in Ukraine has seen these types of systems used, and we see potential for this to play out by many sides and many different conflicts, no matter where they are in the world. We, as members of a military that might find ourselves involved in one of those conflicts, need to be able to rapidly produce and procure systems and execute high-end, full-scale operations using the, those types of systems uh, that come from Replicator. And we've also got to build an internal supply chain and a logistics network that can sustain these operations over time. Part of this, so part of the solution to this problem is harnessing technologies like 3D printing, uh, but it also requires a lot more than that. Uh, there's a number of things that you can't 3D print. You need some advanced electronics that can run the brains of this. You might need sensors that uh, you can't 3D print. You've got to have a supply chain that's robust enough to deliver all the capabilities and make an intact system uh, 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 get to the front line. Nonetheless, such an approach offers a cheaper and more dynamic option to employing defensive and offensive uncrewed capabilities. So again, in my view, if you want to generate effects from the air in future conflict, you will sooner or later employ these types of autonomous and uncrewed systems. They will provide a variety of short and long range weapon systems, or they will be, a, that, that autonomy will be uh, applied across a variety of those systems. But this arsenal of systems also can't be static. We can't think of it as we're gonna field one set of them and then we're done. As soon as the enemy observes how we employ our systems in combat or training, whether we're stand in and stand off, uncrewed or manned, they're gonna adjust their defensive and offensive responses. To keep ahead of the adversary, we must also develop and execute an agile and inventive process that can leverage new technology and keep systems fresh, employing them in adaptive and unpredictable ways. And it's this recognition that drove us in AFSENT to stand up a new operational task force called CTF-99. So Combined Task Force 99 is AFSENT's innovative team that leverages commercial off-the-shelf digital and unmanned capabilities to create dilemmas for our adversaries. It is a small, elite team with a broad range of specialties, but with the potential to expand based on what capabilities we're able to acquire and the missions that we assign to this team. The task force also increases our partnership opportunities with other militaries in the region, creating new collaborative space where nations can bring together innovative subject matters to apply creative solutions to some very complex problems. In its first year of operations, CTF-99 has already seen remarkable growth, expanding its geographic reach across the Arabian Peninsula and the Levant, and increasing the volume of capabilities that it has in its arsenal. We focused our team at CTF-99 on three lines of effort. The first of these is to increase air domain awareness by building a resilient mesh network of sensors that can provide constant information operating as our eyes and ears, whether over the sea, on land, or in the sky. The second line of effort that we've given them is to figure out how to locate and find hard to detect mobile targets and accelerate our targeting cycle to a speed faster than our enemy can handle or that they can react to. In other words, accelerate our OODA loop. We've already made tremendous progress on this. Finally, the team has been tasked to develop capabilities and concepts that can impose costs and create dilemmas for our adversaries. Our adversaries know our tactics, they understand our decision-making process, and they read our doctrine. By innovating at the tactical edge, Task Force 99 is presenting a new calculus that our enemies are gonna have to solve, and they'll be less ready to respond to it 
as a result. As I mentioned, what makes this team somewhat unique is its combined nature. It's not just American airmen, but we have participation from six coalition partners and we expect more to join soon. These strategic partners are key to maintaining our technological edge and creating an environment that supports constant innovation and progress. Beyond our partners in the region, we've also built partnerships across the innovation ecosystem, including with academic institutions like George Mason University and the Air Force Academy. We're trying to set the foundational needs uh, in place that'll bring the next generation of creative thinkers, doers, and leaders uh, into the fold. CTF-99, again, has a diverse team of experts, well postured to leverage new and developing technologies. We've got folks who can do open source coding for autonomous capabilities. We've got folks who can uh, find and use commercially available and cheap over the horizon capabilities. We've got folks trained to 3D print. And I'll just give you one example. You know, 3D printing a UAS uh, can be done at a much lower cost than buying something off the shelf uh, uh, on, the, on the market. It also enables us, if we have enough printers, to scale production to hundreds of UASs. <coughs> Excuse me. Bringing the parts and logistics necessary right up into the theater of war. We just recently successfully flew our first 3D printed small U UAS. We call it the Kestrel. This system can fly, without going into all the details, hundreds of kilometers, fly a multi kilogram payload uh, that could be a weapon, a sensor, any number of things. That system was fully designed by CTF 99, and the price point is $2,500 per copy. Think what I could buy, or how many of these I could buy, if I offset that against a more traditional capability. Conceivably, you could buy tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of these, if you could, again, scale the production. And with that many, think of the dilemma that you could impose on your adversary. Think of the wrong side of the cost curve that the adversary would be on if they tried to shoot everyone down. In cooperation with CENTCOM, we're exploring how to scale that production uh, of that Kestrel UAV and others that we have into the thousands, dramatically shorten the parts and logistics chains needed to sustain that scale, and combine that production capability with autonomy so that we have a cheap intel collector or weapon system that we can use at a time and place of our choosing. We've got options where we could employ these platforms alone, or we could uh, uh, employ them in some sort of a swarm, but regardless of how they're employed, the takeaway here, as the DepSecDef highlighted, is that small, smart, cheap, and many is going to be the way that I see effects being achieved in the future when and where we need them. Where autonomy can really multiply effects is in identifying targets with human input. CTF-99 is working with the Air Force Research Laboratory and small businesses to create solutions for a UAS with automated target recognition capability. This would be released with a set of targets to watch out for while it's on its mission, along with instructions of what to do if the target were found. Using machine learning, the system will gradually get better and better at identifying targets. And this is indicative of just how powerful this technology can be. Once acquired and within a well-established concept of operations, these systems only become more capable with the tasks that we give to them. As these examples hopefully illustrate to you, collaboration with commercial vendors, those who are at the forefront of technolog technological innovation, significantly bolsters military capabilities today. We're proud of our partnerships with commercial vendors and our ability to focus on advancing technology, but also a shared commitment to ethical standards. The success and growth of CTF-99 is shaping how we conduct military operations. Their strategies are influencing other air components around the globe and other services and we're learning lessons that we believe are exportable to other problem sets and other theaters. As CTF-99 grows, so will our need to adapt our command and control protocols, and that change is inevitable, and that's where some of the ethical dilemmas start to come into play. But those are challenges that we're eager to, eager to meet. So there still are a, is a long way to go and a lot of thorny technological and ethical issues we need to deliberate uh, about solving. I'd caution that anyone who would consider any innovative concepts, including applying AI, machine learning, or uncrewed systems, thinking about them as silver bullets that by themselves solve a military problem is the wrong way to think about it. These innovations have to be paired with valid concepts of operation and a solid ethical framework to make them effective in any expected operating environment. 
A concept based on tactics or technology is interesting, but only when paired with a concept of operations does it become compelling to me. And while the technology isn't there yet for a fully autonomous UAS that can make its own targeting decisions, we need to assess the ethical dilemmas ahead of time in order to know what we're gonna do when that tech is ready for fielding. As a commander, you all know this, but there's a number of ethical and legal constraints that I operate within to achieve military objectives. If we are to employ autonomous systems, we need them to operate within the same constraints, the same constraints that I expect human operators to operate within, and in line with commander's intent, with my intent. In that spirit, I'd like to offer a few problems that from my perspective as a commander, need to be solved in order to deploy these types of systems at scale on the battlefield. One of our foundational problems, of course, is target identification. Uh, we are required to meet the law of war principle of distinction and only go after valid military targets. As we've seen in wars of the previous two decades, identifying targets from the air comes with a unique set of problems, most of them derived from the fog of war and uncertainty. Getting the fidelity of information needed requires multiple sensors with data from a variety of domains, increasing our confidence that we're targeting what we intend to before we employ lethal force. Errors can have very large consequences, and this makes a lot of people understandably reticent to hand these types of decisions over to the machines. But this is an area where autonomy and uncrewed systems may actually give us an advantage. Low-cost systems, say a swarm of sensors, that can be sent in very close to a target are able to get higher fidelity information without risk to human life or to expensive aircraft. Those autonomous systems may actually enable us to increase the data available to give us a higher confidence assessment on military targets. And they can also remove the risk for errors that cost human lives due to human bias. A follow-on problem to target identification is the decision to engage a target. This is significantly more complicated in my view. You have to have complete confidence you're looking at a valid enemy target, but if that target's next to a school or a mosque or a church, you have a new set of issues that you have to think through. Combine that with violations of the law of war that we've seen from adversaries in the past, such as using human shields, and you have a Gordian knot that's difficult for humans to untie, much less for artificial intelligence. Under current rules, a human commander can make a decision to strike a target even if there's potential for civilian casualties, if the military value of that target outweighs the risk of the civilian losses. These are gut-wrenching decisions to make as a commander. And it's almost impossible for me to see how we can delegate that type of decision-making to a machine. But we need to think through it. Should that analysis only be left to humans? If not, how do we impart those value judgments to a machine, even one that learns? I would offer, in order to delegate target engagement authority to a machine, we must place certain constraints upon it. These might mean there are certain scenarios in which the machine is simply not allowed to engage unless it gets guidance from a human. Um, and this is an area in which I think autonomy could help that commander make that decision as well. If I find myself faced with a consuming array of data some of it contradictory and uh, certainly the volume of it being somewhat overwhelming and I'm getting that all instantaneously, it's nearly impossible for me to digest all of that and make sense of it. But a good AI ML system might be able to do that more quickly and more accurately assess the potential for collateral damage. It might provide for more protection of civilians if we use it to assist a human. At the very least, it might provide a more complete picture for that human commander to make a final ethical judgment. Finally, we also need to think about how to build accountability into all of our autonomous technology. Commanders need to retain a certain degree of oversight of their forces, and that principle is all the more imperative for machines. Even if human input is not necessary for the system to operate on its own, a human, in my view, must remain on the loop somewhere to ensure the system is functioning correctly, function, functioning correctly and meeting the commander's intent in accordance with the law of war. That's one reason why AI comes to a decision how AI comes to a decision is just as important as the decision itself. Autonomous systems must be auditable and their calculus transparent. Self-learning or continuously updating military IA capabilities have to be subject to a monitoring process to ensure that critical safety features have not been overruled. So in the end, there's a number of difficult but not insurmountable concerns that we'll need to think through over the coming years. 
These, the risks that we've been discussing require us to be deliberate in how we design and deploy autonomous and uncrewed systems, and we're not without guideposts, fortunately. As General Guillaume highlighted, DOD Directive 3000.09 does provide some strong ethical principles that can guide AI development. The technology has to be responsive, equitable, traceable, reliable, and governable. These principles drive rigorous validation and testing of systems to ensure they function as desired with operational effectiveness and consistent with the intent of a human commander. To me, this is an exciting time. Many sense we're entering a new phase of technology of, uh, development, one that will drive changes to the character of war, and some think even to the very nature of war. It will require fresh thinking to control the skies of the future, but we should not step back from that. We should remain grounded in long-established moral principles, but we have to embrace the technology and think about how we'll apply it moving forward. If we retain the moral high ground in this burgeoning area of, era, uh, of technology, we'll need everyone here, the students, the academics, the practitioners, the innovators, other commanders, to help solve these problems. Consider the ethical questions from this conference and keep in mind as you disentangle how to develop this technology responsibly that in the end it's gonna be used to kill other humans. We have an opportunity to shape future conflicts, how they are fought, and ideally, how they're not fought so that we can maintain a deterrent advantage to ensure those conflicts are avoided in the first place. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, in general, for your in-depth remarks. And we are ready now to start our afternoon breakout sessions. So I'm going to read out the topics for the sessions. Uh, session one, artificial intelligence, ethics, and lethal autonomy held in room 3711, moderated by Lieutenant Colonel Lushenko. Session number two, the future of uncrewed systems held in room 3708, moderated by David Desroches. Number three, civilian industry use and advancement of UAVs held in room 2709, moderated by Dr. Malarkey. And, secure, and then uh, number four, security of autonomous systems held in room 3709, moderated by uh, Dr. Sargoziai to do this. And after the sessions, we'll take a quick break until 345. But at 345, allow me to emphasize, we will come back so the moderators can give us a very brief review and takeaways from their sessions and then we'll have closing remarks by General McKenzie. So again, we'll see you everybody back in this room at 3.45, so enjoy your breakout sessions. Okay, good afternoon. If we can take our seats, we're ready to start with our review and the summary of our breakout sessions. Almost, folks, almost. But this conference has been so good that I don't think anyone wants to go anywhere. Okay, so let's get started. So what we want to do is briefly, and what I've been hearing, let me tell you what the argument is between our moderators, okay? The argument is who had the best breakout session. And I'm trying to figure out how to put a little bit more fuel on that fire by, by do that. So what we're gonna do, let, let's just go down the line from Armand to Matt, to David, to Paul and Mike, and just briefly summarize your session, maybe some key takeaways, and maybe some recommendations hmm. uh, for us. So I'll stop here, Armand, sure. go ahead, please. Sounds good. So Tell us what, uh, the, I mean, the name of your session yeah. and everything so, else. Yeah, we had a session for security of uh, autonomous systems. So we have started to talk about challenges with security of autonomous systems in general, such as we have a problem with communication protocols, existing communication protocols. We have problem with resources, like constraints on resources. So we discussed that, and then after that, we have started to talk about uh, some of the things that we can do in order to check the security of um, autonomous systems in general. For instance, we can start to work on comprehensive and uh, comprehensive testing and verification of autonomous systems 
in a systematic manner that we can make sure those systems are safe and secure when we want to use them. Then we, uh, later in the discussion, we started to have uh, two groups uh, to dive deep in into conversations. So we had a group on data privacy and also data security. And then second group that we had, it was on supply chain because those are really important whenever we are talking about security or cybersecurity aspects of autonomous systems. So if I want to talk briefly about that, uh, one of the uh, important thing that we have started to talk in data uh, security, data privacy, was the fact that what's the definition of security? That's, that's really like a general question. And we have started to discuss the fact that anything that is disturbed, the safe operation of autonomous system, we call it cyber attack, if it's externally and it's through external like uh, forces, or ex ex external uh, facts. Uh, one of the things that uh, we discussed also, we said that uh, we have the best protocols, the communication, for instance, protocols, that is going to transmit from one UAV, let's say, to another UAV. That protocol cannot be hacked at all. That's the way that people, they just call it. It's unhackable. But if I can only spoof or jam the signal between one UAV to another one when it's the communication, with just few seconds or one second delay, that is going to cause a lot of consequences on unsafe situations. That we call it also not, uh, that we call it also something that is under attack or is hacked. So it's not only like hack in the terms of like man in the middle attack or some other attacks. The other conversation we had in the uh, data security, we talked about terms and conditions whenever we are uh, using any uh, components, sensors, processors, GPUs for autonomous systems, we need to know terms and conditions, what are the data that they are going to be collected. We need to know uh, about those in advance, how to save data, where the data is going to be uh, stored, how they are going to really like, look at those data, how they are going to manage those data, where are the places that they, those data are being uh, sell, sold? So those are also important. And then uh, some of the recommendations that we had, uh, they were talking about the fact that all the components, they have to have uh, like some policies about data security and we need to have a good protocol about data security and also we need to look at it and we need to test and verify it that the protocol is being done correctly and we are checking that process uh, in a systematic manner. It's not like just somebody or some people that are saying that we are saving it like this and there is no breaches and we are just making sure that all the data is, uh, sa is safe. So that is about the uh, data security or data privacy. The other discussion we had it was about supply chain. So we find out the most important challenge that we have in supply chain is human factor. So that's one of the important factors that we have to take a look at. And how we can address those problems is through uh, education, integrity, and also policy restrictions for supply chain. So one of the discussion we had, we said that we can come up with some policies or bill of materials for, uh, let's say we can take a look at all the bill of materials and we can be transparent about it but we have to make sure that other factors are considered. For instance, we talked about, uh, uh, we talked about made in US again, uh, like all made in US or made in other countries. And we said that even though if something is completely made in US, there are some places in supply chain uh, process that they can be sabotaged. For instance, the, from A to B when we are trans, tra uh, uh, transferring some equipments or components, they can be changed or they can be, like, let's say, uh, modified. Or even there are some people that they are developing, manufacturing, or designing those uh, products or components, they can be under influence of other, let's say, uh, enemies or other countries, and uh, we might not be able to figure it out in advance. We might be able to figure it out long way when we are using those autonomous vehicles or autonomous systems down the road. So that was the brief conversation, brief summary of what we did and what uh, we had, uh, di what we discussed in our uh, breakout session. Thank you, Arman. Extremely informative. Matt? 
All right. Um, I think the best way to describe our panel uh, was talking to industry about dual use and state of the shelf um, and the rapid, rapid pace of change. Um, and so a couple of different topics came up and then one or two interesting sort of uh, summative uh, thoughts occurred to me as you know we looked at all of the uh, interactions. And so I do wanna thank our panelists, Charles, Sean, um, Jerry and Tim who are here in the audience. But some thoughts that sort of topics that were really investigated. The first is this rapid speed of change and what it really means in this autonomous vehicle and this technology space. It's not the only obviously technology space that is rapidly changing, but when you have a collision between a typical DOD or even a civilian procurement cycle and the pace of procurement versus the pace of change, you're gonna have a natural conflict. And we talked quite a bit about some examples of that, um, as well as some examples of how we're getting around that um, and with some of the opportunities for leaders in DOD, leaders in government and procurement to somehow manage um, to increase the pace of procurement, maybe by allowing for more specific off the shelf for guided applications. I think the second thing we talked about was that this is not a just a DOD challenge. It's happening in every industry out there, energy, first responders, medicine, uh, package delivery, et cetera. And so there's a theme that came up about multi-use, multi-platform, and the interoperability among those platforms. I think the third thing that came up was that both in the military space, but also in the civilian space, every network is at risk. And so building these networks, um, these drone networks, autonomous vehicle networks, with a hardening of the network as well. Have you pen tested it? Have you prepped it? Some of the security of the system. Obviously, we want fairly complex networks and they're gonna get more complex. So what do you do to harden um, your implementation. And that's as equally important if you're flying drones over a city, over a port, um, or a nuclear power station, as it is in any of the DOD environments that we can think of. Um, one of the comments in a fourth way, not all fires are lethal. And in fact, the theme that kind of bubbled up from that is that we think about the last point of Connecticut, kinetic um, attack or intervention, if you will, um, but maybe the majority of the applications are well before we get to that point. So it's not just about delivery uh, of a device on a target as much as it is the entire supply chain and, and where which leads to the next one, which is where is the human in the loop? How do we really think about it effectively? How do we let the human operate at their highest capability and let the system and the data in the system um, provide them either with anomaly detection so that they don't have to look at all that data, which realistically we can't look at anymore, or where pattern detection and recognition is shared, or where is the human in the loop at those critical moments when a really tough decision has to be made? And making sure that we protect all three of those points of human in the loop. I think the last really big thing that came up was that this is, we, we talk about the autonomous, the vehicle, but it is really this combination of sensors, data, and network. And they happen to be delivered by or manned on these vehicles. And really thinking about it in that holistic way for all of these applications. And I think the, the takeaway that I had was that I actually have a lot of hope. Um, and I know we feel the great power competition. I know it's real, but I also know that if you just look at the four panelists that we had and you multiply them by the number of people thinking about not just dual use, but all these applications 
applications in farms and fields as well as those applications that might be attractive. It becomes less about the technology and more about it depends on the application and having people who get very, very close to the application so that we're generating solutions um, for each and every one of those applications at speed, at pace, is really uh, the challenge that I think we talked about. Okay. Thank you, Matt. And you bring up some very good points that we had talked about and also we had some recommendations for future. The absolute integral and central role of the industry in this area. Uh, so for the next great power competition, a conference on artificial intelligence, uh, I'm sure with uh, Jill McKenzie's approval, we will get more industry involved uh, in our discussions and our panels as well to do that. Thank you, Matt. David? Well, thank you. Uh, I want to thank again the conference organizers for having me. Uh, I want to thank the members of the panel for a disc or of the group for a uh, discussion that never lagged, and I want to thank our recorder. Thank you, Madam, for uh, sacrificing your uh, writing hand to the cause. And then I want to extend my condolences to the other mopes on the panel because they're um, fighting for second place. Um, our panel, our, our breakout was that good. There's a significant amount of overlap with what we just heard. Uh, basically, the, uh, we were talking about the future of uncrewed systems, and honestly, uh, the only limiting fact on the future of uncrewed systems are people. Um, at the end of the day, we are seeing uh, advancement. There was some disagreement as to whether sensors are advancing more rapidly than the um, uh, data processing capability needed to process the level of data that these sensors are collecting. We couldn't come to a consensus on that. But over and over again, we found out that it doesn't really matter because the people who actually receive the data and have to um, make the decisions are overwhelmed in any event. We spoke of a possible mitigating factor, which was to have um, shipboard uh, uh, machine learning enabled technology to perform an initial screen to lessen the uh, possible ambiguity that comes uh, at the receiving end of it. Uh, we initially opened up with a scenario discussion to provoke, uh, a scenario to provoke it, dealing with a fully autonomous, uh, use of a fully autonomous uh, self-directed weapon system, and the, uh, the breakout almost immediately rejected that as undesirable. Um, so there's the um, idea that there has to be a human in the loop, and the reason for that is the prevention of false positives. And we're like, okay, what if you know the human in the loop is tired, uh, you know, and and the software gets better? They said, well, there has to be a human in the loop, <laughs> even if there are false, false positives. This brought us down to the issue of trust, and uh, you know, trust uh, is difficult for us because it has an emotional component. One of the things we realized in our discussion is that we have different levels of trust based on the domain of warfare that your uncrewed system is in. So we, for example, um, one, of the, one of the members raised the issue of naval mines, which are autonomous weapon systems and have been used for over 80 years. Uh, we have a degree of trust there that we don't have with autonomous air vehicles, for example, conducting attacks. So um, I was thinking about how to quantify this trust because it does have an emotional response, and it, it varies by domain, it varies by situation. I was going to introduce a unit of trust measurement, but I uh, uh, realized that that was impossible, and so I said, okay, what, I asked the panel, what can we do to actually increase trust? And they came back to three things which I think are going to be at a premium in modern warfare. Uh, time together, uh, familiarity, um, uh, established expertise and rapport, which means that uh, there has to be a track record. Um, one uh, person uh, spoke of the, the fact that new technology is always disliked and always suspect, uh, which reminded me of the uh, story of uh, the old question that applies to almost every institution of higher learning. How many alumni does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is five. One to change the light bulb and four to complain about how much they like the old light bulb. Um, we have that issue here with this technology. And unfortunately, uh, we're in a bind here because to establish that level of trust, you have to have familiarity with the system, with the operators, and with everybody who interacts with it. 
And yet, modern warfare is increasingly more likely to be a pickup game. So um, the sensors are getting better, the artificial intelligence is getting better, the platforms are getting better, but what we're seeing is that at the end of the day, uh, warfare is what it was to the Roman legions, um, a conflict among men, uh, men, small m, uh, that is dependent upon a variety of decisions. It becomes lethal, it becomes faster, but we still have a human dimension in this, which is the true limiting factor. Our two trends to watch for the future, one was swarms, and one was the possibility of hypersonics, um, steerable, not just fast, but fast and steerable. And uh, with that, I will thank, once again, the breakout group and extend my condolences to you people fighting for second place. Well, David, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think in the literature, in, in the discourse of what we have in the latest academic is the key is how, you, how do you measure that trust? What is that yes. methodology? What a so, great segue. What a great, yeah. what, what, what a great, great segue you got the, there. The yeah. measurement is called a trusticle. You must have had So I think David session. coined the term oh. here, okay? Uh, so okay. we'll go with that. And well, Paul and Mike, there's two of you to disprove David. Don't don't let him get away with it. <laughs> just just uh, a little bit of a Yeah, so we, we had a great breakout session as well. And I really want to thank first and foremost uh, the leadership here at GNSI, um, mm -hmm. General McKenzie and others for putting on a phenomenal conference and venue, uh, as well as our breakout session, which was truly enlightening. I think I learned more, we learned more uh, than, uh, when we came into the, to the breakout session. So we actually studied uh, squarely the question of trust in AI-enabled technologies in the context of large-scale ground combat operations. So despite a recognition that trust is integral to the adoption of these capabilities in future warfare, we actually really lack leverage over what Features of a technology shape soldiers, especially soldiers' trust in these capabilities and adoption thereof. And it's really integral because soldiers are consequential to the experimentation, the testing, the fielding of capability. And indeed, policymakers, experts, Jennifer and others recognize this. But when we took a look at the discourse throughout the last couple of days, it was unclear to us if we really had a way ahead for a concerted research agenda. And so again, we focus on this question of what shapes trust by way of soldiers in these AI-enabled technologies. And we did this in three parts. First, as any good sort of academic approach, we attempted to define what trust was. Second, uh, as David attempted to do, we kind of outlined the key <laughs> attributes of trust, pulling on existing research from the best of US and in foreign institutions, so MIT, Cornell, I uh, had to put in the, the foot stomp for the alma mater. And then UQ from University of Queensland uh, in Australia with our Aussie counterparts. And then finally, is we outlined in sort of a methodological way the key approaches that we uh, recommend that scholars in here, students in here, uh, policy experts in here adopt going forward. So first and foremost, what is trust? So this is a complex and multi-dimensional concept. It's very complicated, it's situationally dependent, it's also personality dependent, and there's a lot of social psychology baked into this concept. But nevertheless, we were resolved that trust is about being vulnerable to a capability based upon, as David had mentioned, rightly so, shared expectations, shared experiences, shared values, shared interest. Now, if that's the case, what are the key attributes of trust in the context of AI-enabled technologies for future war? Pulling on existing studies, there was a lot of similarities across these institutions in terms of reliability, the level of accuracy, the level of autonomy, the reps and sets that one would get um, across time and space to have an expectation, a prediction of uh, performance. And so having said that, well, how are, we gonna, how are we gonna study it? And this is where we broke out into two different groups. Uh, Michael fo focused on what we had called the top-down perspective, which is to say sort of a qualitative survey-based and interview-based rather approach. And I focused on the sort of quantitative bottom-up perspective, tapping into soldiers' attitudes for these capabilities. And so I'm going to hand it over to Mike, and he'll explain everything he did, I guess, about a minute or so. In about a minute or so, yeah. yeah. Um, well, we'd actually, we went <laughs> back at first to start, starting with some of the ideas of defining who our audience was, because when we talk about leadership, it's as ambiguous as trust is here, because as you mentioned earlier, 
we have different leaders working with different levels of AI at all levels of potential mission commands. So we want to answer, are we, ta are we talking about three-star generals? Are we talking about the 06 level? In some cases, all the way down to the captain's level. How do we want to define that? And really, what are we talking about with this question of AI? Because AI is an ambiguous question, just as trust is an ambiguous question. And that led back to us redefining the issue of trust. It's not a hard concept. It's not even a uh, variable. It's actually comprised of multiple variables that are going to uh, be different at different situations depending on the uh, looking at the consequences to both uh, friendly troops and to innocent bystanders as well as the duration and depth of experience with the uh, particular artificial intelligence. And sometimes these issues aren't going to be strictly linear. We noted that some commanders actually, the less experience they have with AI, in some cases, the more artificial trust they're going to have with them. Hey, so give me, sprinkle some AI magic onto this and we'll figure it out later. So sometimes a little bit can be so dangerous. So then we wanted to say, how do, who do we want to do as our audience and how do we want to drive the questions? And we could do this through a set of focus groups, through a set of inter interviews, and use that to frame a set of uh, questions, starting with how, how this person defines AI. What parts of the, your mission would you not allow AI to handle? And then dig into the questions from that of why and lead to a discussion in that general direction. And if we have this uh, from a number of different perspectives, we can then use this to, to a multi, for a multi-level sur uh, survey instrument. We could then actually go a quantitative route, then use this to frame a series of questions that we can then take back to the war college level, to the staff college level, across the services, and then say, how can we define levels of trust at the leadership level, and how do we observe it there? The top-down approach. What about the bottom-up approach? And, and I should admit that this is predicated on the assumption that soldiers' attitudes actually matter. And that may sound sort of counterintuitive, but yet we understand that soldiers are indoctrinated in the chain of command and they follow orders. So we had a really rich conversation about the degree to which soldiers' attitudes at the team, squad, platoon, company, battalion level actually matter. And our contention was that, th that they do, uh, because ultimately soldiers are going to be employing uh, these systems. So having said that, how would we study soldiers' attitude? Well, there's a movement afoot within political science research to adopt what we call a conjoint-based survey design which is to say you can vary a whole lot of stuff and figure out what shapes attitudes of trust. And so in my own research at the Army War College, I'm tapping into attitudes of emerging senior leaders at the 05 and 06 level to see what shapes their trust and capability given variation in the platform of use. So is it aerial-based? Is it ground-based? Is it space-based? The purpose, broadly conceived as non-lethal versus lethal. The precision the autonomy, the effectiveness defined in terms of the risk ratio between civilian casualties and friendly protection, and then finally the contribution that a capability would make to a war outcome or a political objective, as well as who else is adopting the capability? Is a peer adversary, China, Russia adopting the capability? And finally, how it's regulated. And so when you vary all of this, you can figure out what really shapes trust, which again is a complex and multidimensional concept. I think what we have here is actually a really interesting research agenda that's shaping up. That as Mike stated, we can tap into soldiers' attitude at pre-commissioning at our respective military academies. We can then survey um, officers at intermediate level education, whether they're captain's career courses, the war colleges, and then by way of elite surveys, figure out if there really is a notion of a digital native uh, that uh, younger people would just outsource trust because they've been inculcated with this sort of environment, or if there's real questions about precision, autonomy, and so on and so forth. Mm. And then finally, you could extend this cross-nationally, you can imagine, to allies and partners within Western nations as well. And if I might add just one thing I, I did mention, we talked about a number of subjects, but you'll note that our official breakout when we started was AI ethics, which we chose to focus on this trust question, but we came back a number of times to this issue of the tie-in between trust and ethics. Does one lead to the other or vice versa? How do they relate to one another? So especially at the elite surveys, one of the big questions we look at was how, how do you define or how does the ethical considerations weigh when you would or would not use AI? Do you use a virtue, consequentialist, deontological? What's your... Uh, foundational belief system and how does that in turn shape your value system for when you would employ it? So thank you very much and I'll leave it up to you to determine who had the best breakout group. Well, thank you, thank you very we much. We actually set out to solve the problem. <laughs> well, maybe next time we should create some kind of an AI app so we can vote yes. as an audience <laughs> uh, to do that. So we'll make that happen for next time. One more time, thank you so much thank for you. all this. We have our...
and we have our research agendas, we have our way forward, and we have learned a great deal. Now, please join me in welcoming once again Gerald McKenzie for his final closing remarks. Look, everybody, I'm going to spare you lengthy remarks. Um, it's a little after four. We've had a full day. I appreciate all of you being here. And uh, I think we've learned a lot over the past couple of days. Uh, and I would like to just thank, thank a couple of people, particularly Adib for Hardy. Adib, thank you so much. Let's give him a round of applause. I'd like to thank the staff of GNSI who did all the hard work to put it together, the staff of the Marshall Center who were very supportive and made everything happen, and, uh, and particularly all the presenters, the, the, the people that actually got up here and talked and shared their knowledge. Some of them are here, many of them spoke and had to leave, such as General Grinkovich and, and General Guio, but, uh, but we really appreciate what they did. So we're, we're very happy with this kind of uh, conference. We're gonna do another one in uh, the spring of the year, and it's gonna be on AI and we're going to use some of the lessons learned that we, we picked up on how to present for this conference as we go forward to that one. In December, we're going to talk about cyber, and we're going to talk about China's operations and presence in the cyber domain, and that'll be on 7 December. That'll be a one-day conference. But we're going to continue to do these, and we hope to see many of you back here for these as we continue into the future. And that's really all I got. Like I said, I'm not going to inflict, uh, I'm not going to inflict a detailed analysis of what happened today on you here at the end of the day. Thanks for being here. It's been a blast. Bye-bye.